Good morning. This is a uh, hearing of the House Energy and Commerce Oversight and Investigations Committee entitled a continuing investigation into the fungal meningitis outbreak and whether it could have been prevented. The subcommittee is here today because 53 people died from a pain medication manufactured by the New England Compounding Center, NECC. Those patients trusted that the steroid injected into their spine or their joints to relieve chronic pain was perfectly safe because of the confidence our nation's health care providers place in the Food and Drug Administration. But that drug was contaminated with fungus, a form of mold that attacks bones and nerves. More than 700 people who have received these lethal injections continue to have symptoms. Today, they are living with the unbearable horror of not knowing whether they will survive. They must spend weeks in the hospital missing work, holidays, times with families. They must take large doses of morphine to ease the pain. Each day has lived under the deadly threat of an infection that could reach their brains and kill them. This outbreak is one of the worst public health disasters in our country's history and is a terrible tragedy and an epic failure. Sadly, the Food and Drug Administration, which is supposed to protect the public, has spent its time passing blame and hiding behind judicial robes rather than taking any responsibility. At a hearing last November, Commissioner Hamburg told this committee that the FDA faced, quote, complex, unquote, issues in taking enforcement action against the New England Compounding Center. Here is the truth. This outbreak begins with NECC illegally shipping 17,000 vials of supposedly sterile drugs without patient prescriptions. The FDA insists it could not tell the difference between a corner drug store compounder who makes cough syrup for a child and a massive manufacturer illegally shipping into 23 states. This committee has discovered the agency had information that should have spurred it to act and stop this rogue outfit from continuing to operate as an illegal manufacturer of sterile medication. This outbreak is simply not complex, nor was it a surprise they were under the nose of the FDA for a decade. The FDA field staff and FDA headquarters repeatedly received complaints about NEC's numerous transgressions. They even considered additional inspections and enforcement. Ten years of warning signs, alarm bells, and flashing red lights were ignored. Complaints from patients and nurses and pharmacists and doctors, pain clinics, hospitals, drug companies, drug distributors, and even confidential company informants. But the only health care entity that didn't seem worried was FDA headquarters. Ultimately, the FDA knew NECC was breaking the law but chose to do nothing. In 2007, the FDA received complaints from patients getting epidural injections of an injectable steroid manufactured by NECC. FDA knew long ago that this, was very, that this very NECC product hospitalized patients with meningitis-like symptoms. These complaints led to FDA's first inspection of NECC. And this time, there's no evidence that FDA even bothered to inform the state or contact the company over the issue. In 2011, a representative from the Institute of Safe Medication contacted FDA. This complaint read, quote, as a practicing pharmacist, I'm shocked that such a product would be allowed to be distributed for use in the United States. FDA officials found the product to be extremely dangerous. And they should further warn that this bag should not be directly infused to the patient. Uh, this is unbelievable. I think this is a disaster waiting to happen, unquote. After FDA headquarters approved, then rejected, sending a warning letter to Ameridose in 2009, the current director of FDA's New England District Office angrily informed other enforcement officials of the FDA, quote, I've told our investigations branch to not bother inspecting compounding pharmacies if we aren't going to act on the violations, unquote. FDA's primary mission is to protect the public health from unsafe drug products. On numerous occasions, the agency confronted a choice in dealing with NECC and Ameridose, take action to protect patients or wait. Repeatedly, the FDA made a conscious decision to do nothing. In particular, under the watch of Dr. Hamburg, the FDA put enforcement actions against NECC and Ameridose on hold in 2011 through 2012 because FDA lawyers wanted to wait until finishing a revision of guidance document. During this inspection holiday, 53 people died. At the last hearing, Congressman Terry Scalise and I asked Dr. Hamburg where in the law it said FDA could not act. The FDA did not answer a question. We now know that there was nothing in the law that prevented the FDA from acting because in the last few weeks before this hearing, the FDA has conducted a highly visible campaign of inspections. This flurry of well-publicized activity exposes the FDA's charade. The agency cannot argue it lacked authority to inspect NECC and Emeridos, but now, after the outbreak, has the authority to conduct these inspections. No law has changed. The only change is the FDA now decided to act. During a November hearing, Dr. Lawrence Smith of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health recognized that her agency could have done things differently. She didn't hide behind ongoing investigations, lawsuits, or limited authority. Instead, she admitted that her agency had moved too slowly, that if they had acted quickly in 2012, it would have prevented about a third of the deadly drug from being shipped. She took immediate personal actions as a result of these conclusions. 
The hope of this committee is that we will hear admissions from the FDA that reflect decisive leadership, at admission of what went wrong internally to delay inspections, warnings, and actions. What I worry about is we'll hear more this morning of continued litany of excuses, bureaucratic talk, and blame on outside organizations. For the sake of the families of those who died and those who are still sick, we will not stop in our effort to get answers and fix this problem. I now recognize my distinguished colleague from Colorado, Ranking Member Diana DeGhetto, who I think also wants us to uh, recognize some of the um, consent here, too. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I know I join you and the rest of the members of this subcommittee in expressing our deepest condolences to those who are affected by the tragic events yesterday in Boston. And we're all thinking about all of the victims. Our colleague, Mr. Markey, has been very interested in this investigation. And <clears throat> understandably, he's not here today. But he wanted to participate. And he has a statement. And he also has a um, October 2012 report that you folks have seen called Compounding Pharmacies, Compounding Risk. And I ask unanimous consent those both be entered into the record. Without objection, they'll be entered. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to thank you for having today's hearing. Obviously, this fungal meningitis outbreak is a serious, serious situation. And um, our committee needs to understand the facts about how and why it occurred and what we can do to prevent it in the future. I think that this investigation has the potential to become part of the great bipartisan oversight history of this committee. I know that good investigations don't always let result in legislative change, but in this case, I think we can use this investigation to help us identify the legislative changes, if any, that we need to help us avoid tragedies like this again in the future. As hospitals, clinics, and other medical providers outsource more of their compounding, a number of compounding pharmacies have sprung up, and frankly, they've been operating underneath the regulatory radar screen. A spotty pattern of state regulations and enforcement, combined with conflicting federal law, have made that even worse. So, Mr. Chairman, I want to talk about some of the facts we've uncovered as we've spent the last five months investigating the New England Compounding Center, the FDA, and the deadly fungal meningitis outbreak caused by contaminated compounded drugs. First of all, as we all can stipulate, the owners and operators of NECC ran a shoddy fly-by-night operation and jeopardized the lives of thousands of people. Second, for several years prior to the outbreak, the FDA received warnings about the company from its own inspectors, from state boards of pharmacy, and from whistleblowers. The FDA received warnings about and seriously considered investigating Ameridos, NECC's sister company, just a few months before NECC began to ship the deadly steroid products. Uh, one of the states that discovered these deficiencies was my own home state of Colorado. And in fact, my state board of pharmacy issued a cease and desist order to stop the company's practices. Now, I'm, co I'm confident that we can all agree on these two facts from both sides of the aisle. But I also hope that we can agree on a third fact that will help explain why the FDA was unable to effectively regulate this company. Then I hope that we can act together to fix the problem. Mr. Chairman, in October 2012, this committee requested thousands of pages of document from the FDA about their interactions with NECC and their approach to regulating compounded uh, drugs. The Democratic staff has reviewed these documents and yesterday released a supplemental f memo with key findings. I'd also ask unanimous consent that this memo be made a part of the hearing record. Um, this pattern of documents from 2002 through last year demonstrates that under two administrations and over 10 years, the FDA has not been aggressive enough in attempting to regulate compounding pharmacies. The question is why? It is a serious and legitimate question to ask what the agency should have been doing and could have been doing over these many years. And I know from your opening statement you intend to do just that. Um, I also, though, look forward to hearing what specific solutions Commissioner Hamburg and the FBA believe would help them protect the American people from another outbreak. Because these documents show us for a year the FDA has been grappling with a law that is broken. And we need to help fix that law and keep the American public safe. We also need to look at how court decisions impacted the FDA's ability to regulate. Mr. Chairman, you say that the FDA is hiding behind judicial robes, but in fact, 
uh, court decisions are the law of the land. And what we have here in the wake of the serious meningitis outbreak is a patchwork of laws. We have two judicial circuits that are coming up with different decisions about the authority of the FDA, which is causing some of these compounding pharmacies, not all of them, but some of them to resist any regulatory efforts by the FDA. Um, as the FDA has been attempting to better regulate this situation since these issues came out, there have even been instances of compounding pharmacies refusing to provide the FDA access to records or facilities. And as we learned during our food safety investigations and some of our other investigations in this committee, if you have an allegation of little black particles um, in some of the vials of the pharmaceuticals, the FDA and its, and its um, co cooperating agencies need the ability to work fast. And if you have a company that says you can't come in here and makes the FDA go to court, that's not a speedy or a desirable resolution. And so, um, so I'm looking forward to hearing from Commissioner Hamburg about, number one, what the agency has done to improve the situation and to improve enforcement, and number two, what the agency thinks that we need to do legislatively to fix this law so that this will never happen again. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Generally yields back. Now recognize the, the, full chair, the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for convening this very important hearing on the deadly outbreak of fungal meningitis so that the committee can get answers to the question that we could not get last year. What did the FDA know about NECC and Emeritus, and what did the FDA do about it? When Commissioner Hamburg appeared before us last November, 32 innocent Americans had died. Today, the death toll stands at 53 and continues to grow. Hundreds are still sick and suffering, and unthinkable public health disaster continues to get only worse. My home state of Michigan has been hit the hardest by fungal meningitis. According to the CDC, 15 of the 53 folks who died after receiving NECC's contaminated products are from Michigan, including three from my district. 259 of the 730 people who are sick and suffering from infections are from my state. And just a few weeks ago, our Attorney General Bill Schutte, former colleague, announced that he planned to convene a grand jury to investigate possible criminal char charges, and I talked with him again just minutes ago. Criminal cases will rightfully examine the company's liability for this strategy, but it is our job at this committee to also take a hard look at the agency under our jurisdiction, the FDA, and ask, did its process work? Did the agency do its job and protect the public's health? And before we get to the matter of additional authorities and new legislation, we have to ensure that the agency is going to be ready to implement them properly. It's not enough or right just to do something for the sake of doing it. We have to do something that is truly effective to prevent this from happening again. It took months for the FDA to fully cooperate and provide the necessary documents, but now we ha finally have them. And uh, Commissioner Hamburg, as we look at these, we're, many of us are troubled by what we've learned. FDA received complaint after complaint about these companies. FDA's documents paint a picture of two companies who appear to be acting more like manufacturers than compounders. Doctors and other providers made complaints about the sterility of their products, and FDA district staff pushed to go back out and reinspect those companies or take other enforcement action, but in most cases, it simply didn't happen. It is this breakdown that concerns me the most. Job one for the FDA is making sure that medicines we take are safe, but the mission appears to be lost as delays prevented the FDA from taking decisive action and the agency took years to finalize its guidance and regulatory documents. We know now that 53 Americans did not need to die. It sickens me that this could have been prevented. And as we met this last week, I share your hope that this is a constructive hearing. We all want that. We need to get all the facts on the table. We we'll hope that you can help us so we can move forward. We owe it to those families. And I know that we can, uh, we can do better and, and work together. And I yield uh, now to, to Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to echo what you just said. We have um, asked several questions at the previous hearing on this. The first one was, how did this happen? And the second one, could this outbreak have been prevented? Uh, at the time, we didn't get answers. Uh, finally, after the committee has received the documents, uh, we do have at least partial answers to those two questions. To the first question, how did it happen? 
There are two main reasons. Obviously, the company involved acted negligently and didn't follow proper sterilization and sanitation practices. But number two, the FDA, the agency responsible for protecting the public health and safety, uh, did not act properly, did not do what it should have done, and did not act when it could have acted. In fact, it failed to take the necessary action against this company to prevent future outbreaks, even though they had evidence of serious problems dating back to 2002. The answer to the second question, could the outbreak have been prevented? I believe the answer to be yes. I believe it could have been prevented. Today we're going to have our FDA commissioner before us to explain the FDA's failure and hopefully the steps that she is in intending and hopefully has taken to prevent any future actions. With that, I yield the balance of the time to Dr. Burgess. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Look, from a provider's perspective, I recognize the value of compounding pharmacy and compounding pharmacists and that they contribute to the armamentarium of things that we can offer to our patients. But there is a vast difference between compounding a preparation of progesterone to, to treat a condition or compounding a, uh, a pediatric elixir for Tamiflu and being involved in the wholesale manufacture of medicines that are shipped all over the country with no specific patient prescription thereto attached. I, I do have to admit, reading through this litany that has occurred, honestly, before you arrived at the agency, but also since your arrival at the agency, and, and it is troubling, I think the least we can do today is try to uncover those things that were impediments to getting a rapid resolution of this, and, and honestly, we cannot allow it to happen again, and I'll yield back. Gentlemen, you back. Now recognize the uh, ranking member of the committee, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that uh, the comments of Chairman Upton and Mr. Barton and Mr. Burgess are right on point. Uh, this has to be a constructive investigation. We have to know what happened and how to prevent it in the future. This uh, meningitis, meningitis outbreak from compounded drugs has claimed the lives of over 50 people, sickened over 700, brought unspeakable grief upon hundreds of families, and it's one of our nation's worst public health disasters in recent memory. So we need to get to the bottom of this. Our most critical task is to answer this question. How can we prevent another NECC tragedy from occurring again? This one has happened. It's terrible. Last fall, Joyce Lovelace, who lost her husband, courageously testified before this committee, and we should heed her words. She said, don't just investigate. Instead, legislate and regulate. Put aside partisan politics, partisan philosophies, industry lobbying, and wishes of campaign contributions, and unanimously send to the White House a bill that will prevent a recurrence of these events. If you will do that, perhaps my family can take some solace in the fact that Eddie Lovelace's public service continues even after death." End quote. Well, I hope we can remember this advice during today's hearing and stay focused on our most important mission. How can we prevent a recurrence of these events? The committee received in preparation for this hearing over 27,000 documents from the FDA. Mr. Chairman, I agree with your comments that the record shows that FDA missed important opportunities to address problems at NECC. FDA was warned about potential problems at NECC and Emeridos and was simply unable to act or act fast enough. But the documents also show more than that. They show why this happened. And if we want to fix this problem, that's exactly what we need to understand. Mr. Chairman, here's what the documents show. For over a decade, FDA struggled to effectively regulate compounding pharmacies. Basic flaws in the compounding law and a series of conflicting court decisions have created uncertainty and confusion. As a result, FDA was unable to develop a coherent policy. Under this administration, beginning in 2009, 
FDA began to take new steps to develop an enforceable national policy for drug compounders, but it was never finalized. But this was difficult because the court cases created different rules for different parts of the country, which is inherently problematic. <laughs> FDA had to struggle with how to pick up the pieces of a statute in tatters. Mr. Chairman, we should ensure that FDA is able to protect all of us in a uniform way from unsafe compounded drugs. It's Congress's job to fix the law when it is inadequate or when courts invalidate it. And that's why we must do more than blame the FDA for this tragedy. We must heed the words of Joyce Lovelace and act to give the FDA the clear authority they need to keep the American public safe and prevent another drug compounding disaster. I, I'm uh, pleased that Dr. Hamburg is here to further answer questions at the last hearing. A lot of the documents that our committee had requested on a bipartisan basis had not been received, and we now have those documents. And what we have is a, a, a muddied record of inaction where we would have liked to have seen action, uh, clarity in the law to give you your instructions, Dr. Hamburg, but that law wasn't clear and the courts made it even more confusing. Our job is not to dwell on the confusion. Our job is to, to clarify what we want FDA to do, what we expect from FDA. We need to clarify it not just by criticism at an oversight hearing, but by acting together legislatively to spell out what the law must be in order for, to, for FDA to do everything it can to prevent another tragedy like this from occurring again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like yes. to renew my um, unanimous request to put the Democratic memo in the record. Uh, without uh, objection, Thank so you. be it. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce the Honorable Margaret A. Hamburg. She's been the Commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration since May 18, 2009. She's an experienced medical doctor, scientist, and public health executive. Thank you for being here. Uh, I also ask you now, um, let me go here. Let me go in here to this one. Sorry. All right. Uh, you're aware that uh, the committee is holding an investigative hearing and when doing so has the practice of taking testimony under oath. Uh, do you have any objections to testifying under oath? Um, uh, the chair then advises you that under the rules of the House and rules of the committee, you're also entitled to be advised by counsel. Do you desire to be advised by counsel during your testimony today? I have with me uh, Mr. Taylor, who is my uh, senior counselor, uh, and I would like him to be available to answer questions to give you uh, the specific information that you might need. So you have the right to counsel there, too. In that case, would you both please rise and raise your yeah, One moment, yes. Mr. Chairman, I don't believe that Dr. Hamburg's saying he's her lawyer. I think he's no. just a lawyer oh, at FDA here to answer questions. My suggestion would be to swear them both in. We'll swear them both in then, yes. Uh, all right, uh, if you both rise and raise your right hand, I'll swear you in. Do you swear the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. The records show that both have answered affirmatively. affirmatively uh, so you're now under oath and subject to the penalties set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code. Uh, you may now give a five-minute summary of your written statement, Dr. Hamburg. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Dr. Margaret Hamburg, the Commissioner of the FDA. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. I'm joined, as I said, by Mr. John Taylor, my senior counselor and former head of both our Drug Enforcement Office and of the agency's Field Inspection Force. We are at a critical juncture for public health. The deadly outbreak of fungal meningitis associated with a compounded medication last fall was a horrible tragedy. I speak for everyone at the FDA when I say that our hearts go out to the victims and their loved ones. While our investigation of this deadly outbreak has been a top priority, my responsibility is also to make sure that this does not happen again. In looking at the history and our role with compounding pharmacies, it is clear to me that we should have more aggressively applied existing authorities in spite of an ambiguous statute, a changing legal landscape, and continuous challenges by industry to our authorities. We are being more aggressive now. 
We are working with states to inspect pharmacies that we believe may present the highest risk, in addition to responding to specific complaints we may receive. Over the past few months, we've conducted over 55 such inspections. What we've seen is troubling. Serious issues, including quality concerns that have led to product recalls and practices that create risk of contamination. And these inspections have underscored our need for stronger, clearer authority to adequately protect public health. Even in light of the recent tragic events, astonishingly, some of the firms are challenging us, delaying our inspectors or denying them full access to records. In two recent instances, we have had to secure administrative warrants from the courts and have U.S. Marshals accompany our inspectors so they could complete their work. In other cases, we had to threaten the use of warrants to achieve cooperation. Lack of clarity in our statutory authorities is not the only concern. The healthcare system and this industry have evolved tremendously. A new breed of pharmacy compounding, outsourcers, has grown has outgrown the legal framework. These outsourcers produce high volumes of high-risk drugs, often for hospitals, that rely on them to meet critical product needs for their patients. The tools we have under current law for regulating these firms are simply not the right fit. Applying them in full force could lead to significant dislocations in the healthcare system and likely shortages. We need legislation to preserve the benefits of traditional compounding while at the same time giving us the right tools to regulate the highest risk practices and products. For these higher risk compounding pharmacies, we need legislation that requires compliance with federal quality standards, requires federal registration so we know who they are, where they are, and what drugs they're making, and requires reporting to FDA of serious adverse events so that we can act before potential problems grow out of hand. For all pharmacy compounding, certain basic protections should be in place, including clear authority to inspect records to determine the scope and nature of a pharmacy's operations and to more quickly determine the cause of an outbreak, and a prohibition on compounding of the most complex and highest risk products, and clear labeling of compounded drugs to allow prescribers and consumers to make more informed choices. We look forward to working with Congress to explore funding mechanisms to support this oversight. If you look at FDA's attempts to regulate pharmacy compounding over the last 20 years, as detailed in the tens of thousands of pages of documents we provided to the committee, you see that the agency has been struggling with how to effectively oversee this industry. You see numerous approaches that were derailed by a constantly changing legal landscape, challenges to our authority, and conflicting court decisions. I wish that during my tenure I had brought the need for legislation to you sooner, to be frank, Given the history of this issue and the efforts of this industry, there were many at the agency concerned that seeking new authority would result in a weakening rather than a strengthening of the law. But I am here now to ask for your help. We have had an urgent call to action. We are all on notice, and we owe it to the public and the victims to provide better protection in the future. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I thank you for your testimony, um, Commissioner Hamburg. Uh, and I appreciate you want to move forward, but we'd also like to find out if there's things within the FDA that has been going on for the last 10 years that need to be addressed first. So I'm assuming you accept that the buck stops with you with regard to how things are going with the FDA. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Now, the FDA documents show that the FDA put enforcement actions against NECC and Emeridos on hold in 2011 and through 2012 and suspended all inspections of compounders because the FDA wanted to issue new guidance first. For example, on October 24th of 2011, email from a compliance officer in the FDA's district office to the district compliance branch director shows that in light of the FDA process of drafting guidance on compounding, the FDA inspectors did not immediately follow up on an informant's allegations about Emeridos. Sales people were in the clean area filling product and that Emeridos continued to repack Avastin without an FDA license. The email stated that Tamara Eli, the compounding team leader from, C- from Cedar, said 
quote, no compounding facility is slated to be inspected in 2012. And a September 2011 email from a compliance officer at Cedar to others in the FDA headquarters stated, quote, plan is to reinspect Emerido six months after issuance of 503A guidance, unquote. Likewise, an October 2011 memorandum from the Office of Unapproved Drugs and Labeling Compliance stated, currently we have suspended inspections of compounding facilities. We will reinstate proactive inspections based on a risk model three to six months after the finalization of the guidance to the industry. Did you personally approve of the FDA decision to delay or suspend enforcement actions or inspections of compounding facilities, or did somebody else? I was not directly involved in those decisions, but they did reflect the concern that we needed to really have a a clear regulatory regime that was outlined so that we could bring the strongest and best possible cases. So were they then implemented under your knowledge? If you were not the decision maker, were they implemented under your knowledge that they were occurring? I was not aware of those decisions. Were you personally advised at any time about suspending the enforcement actions against compounders back in 2011? It's important to understand that there were ongoing responses with the compounding industry when problems were brought to our attention about specific products, but that in terms of, of a, a proactive inspectional strategy, we did not have uh, the framework in place, and we were, we well, when, were when trying were you, to, to put that in place with the development of the CPG. I, I appreciate that, but we're trying to find out when were you informed about the policy to suspend any enforcement actions and inspections of compounders? I regret that I was not more fully aware, but I when, do... When did you find out? Do you recall? When you finally found out that, that there were no inspections? Do you recall when that was? I want to make clear that there were inspections of compounding facilities w in reaction to specific issues that well, were with brought NECC before us America. with adulterated... Or, or other problems with products, but that there was not a, there, there was this effort going on within the agency to try to develop. I, I understand. I, I'm just trying to help focus here because I, I read you quotes from emails of, of at least three different people that the inspections of NACC and Emeridos were suspended. It's an important decision. Um, had the FDA taken enforcement actions, conducted its own inspections, or caused the Massachusetts Board of Pharmacy to inspect uh, we may have been able to prevent this huge public health disaster. So when the FDA made the decision to suspend compounding enforcement in 2011, did the FDA weigh the potential public health consequences of that decision? It was not a decision to suspend all enforcement I know, just compounding with pharmacies. But I regret that we didn't do more, and I regret that I I'm was not more directly engaged. I appreciate but that. I am now, and I, know. I really hope. So I'm still trying to find out forward. when did you find out that inspections of NECC were suspended? You, you know, I do not recall specifically, but I, I was not aware at that time. Was it in preparation for the hearing in the fall or this hearing that you finally found out that the inspections hadn't been taking place? You know, my, I, as commissioner, obviously am not aware of all of the inspections that we're doing. We're responsible for regulating products that come from over 300,000 different facilities. We're just asking about NECC, and I'm not getting an answer here. But that's important because something appears was hampered with NECC that the information was not going to the top where the buck is supposed to stop. So, and while you're telling us that you didn't have authority to inspect, Last week, a flurry of publicity came out that you went to 30 diff 31 different places. This is the CBS News, an interview with you. And only one of those was uh, someone had questions about a court order. So we're still going to need to get to the answers to that. But I rec see my time is up, so I'm going to now recognize the uh, ranking member, Ms. Deget. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Commissioner Hamburg, did you ever find out why they inspected, why they suspended these inspections while they were writing new guidance? Why couldn't they walk and shoot gum at the same time? There was, I think, real concern given the history with this issue and the repeated challenges to our authorities that we needed to really understand as court decisions but, were coming down what were going to be the, the legal 
what was the legal framework under which we would be so, taking So they were afraid action. that they might not have the authority to do the inspections. Is that what you're saying? We have the authority to do So why couldn't they do both at once? But ins inspections are just, you know, a piece of what needs to be done to take enforcement right. actions. But, so you, you don't know why they didn't do both because you didn't know at the time? Is that what you're saying? Why didn't they both do the inspections and write the new guidelines? I wish that there had been a more aggressive approach in terms of, of okay. inspections. But you don't know why? But I, the, there was an effort to follow up on specific concerns um, that doesn't always require an inspection, but, but the desire was to, the CPG was being worked on in order to really provide clear guidance about okay. the standards under which we would be looking at, at enforcement in these facilities. And, you know, I, I wish it had been completed more quickly. Okay, and I, okay. So, so you testified that now that this is, this is at your level, you, you the, the last number of months since November have been aggressively trying to go in and inspect and that people have, and that various companies have um, tried, have refused entry and you had to get court orders and so on. Uh, very briefly, can you tell me how, how long it took you, it took the FDA from the time that you announced you wanted to go in and inspect to get these to get these orders to get the marshals in, was there a delay because of the resistance of the compounding pharmacies? Yes, there have been a variety of delays in terms of about how long were those delays? Uh, days to weeks. Days to weeks. Okay. Now, are you saying? This is a really pretty simple question. Are you saying that the FDA should have the authority to regulate all drug compounders? We believe that we need to focus on those compounders that are making the highest risk products, the sterile products, um, in advance or without a prescription and shipping uh, to other states. We believe that there are not sufficient standards in place in the law and enforceable. So um, it's really it's it's really a targeted group of compounders that are sh that are engaged in interstate commerce that the FDA believes it needs stronger authority. Is that correct? We believe we need to focus on the highest risk uh, facilities, and that includes those making sterile products and. And what percentage of all the drug compounders is that? Well, we don't really know because we don't because know. Because you don't have the authority of compounders now. because they are not required right. to register with us, and right. we don't have full access to their records to assess right. them. Right now, let's talk about this this court case thing because 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 some people on this committee seem to think this is more important than others. Now, in 2001, the Ninth Circuit Court found that part of the of the 1997 Food and Drug um, Administration Modernization Act was unconstitutional, correct? Correct. And For so, um, and then in 2002, the Supreme Court affirmed that decision about the constitutionality, is that right? Correct. And then in 2008, there was a different court, circuit court, that reached a different conclusion, finding that the key parts of the 1997 drug count compounding law could remain in effect, is that correct? That is correct. And is that that map that your staff put up over there that that looks to me like the map that shows. Yes. So in other words, in the red, that's one of the court decisions. In the blue, that's the other court decision, right? Correct. And then in the gray, that's the rest of the country that's covered by different courts that have not ruled on this, right? Correct. And so the result of this has been that the, um, is that the, the industry has pushed back against the FDA's attempts to regulate, right? Correct. Now, I hope, I hope, I think you do understand, I think you recognize, we're not saying here that this absolves the FDA from responsibility to try, and you believe the FDA does have the responsibility to try to enforce, uh, to, to make sure that these compounding for, uh, pharmacies are, are doing the right thing, right? Absolutely. But, but, but nonetheless, there is not a clarity in the law, and that's hampering the FDA to know clearly what it should do and to do it in a quick fashion. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Now recognize Mr. Barton for five minutes. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Commissioner, I was puzzled as I listened to you evade the answer to uh, the chairman's questions about when you learned you 
you, you, you never gave him a straight answer. So I'm going to ask a question. Let's see if we can get a straight answer. Um, does the sun rise in the east, Madam Commissioner? Um, you have me so confused, I don't know. <laughs> well, I would hope that we could have gotten a straight answer from that. No, uh, yes. My seven-year-old would know the answer to that uh, in the first grade. So if we've now established that you can give us some straight answers, I'll give you one more chance to ask the chairman's, answer the chairman's question. When did you learn about all this? When did you become aware? Just a date, a time. You know, many of the issues that are involved here I did become aware of in the course of, of, of the investigation and reviewing um, the many documents that... that I mean, why are you afraid to just tell us? Because I, I, I'm not... I really don't remember. Compounding pharmacies uh, were... Okay, well, that's that an answer. I was not, you know... Deeply if you really don't remember, you really it. don't remember. So we'll, we'll assume that you really, really don't remember. So I'm going to ask you another question. You've been the commissioner, I think, for a little over four years it's since you got confirmed by the Senate. So when you found out about this problem, how did you feel then and how do you feel now? When the meningitis outbreak began, like all of you, I was deeply concerned and committed the resources of our agency to engaging in the uh, public health investigation and response. And I have been deeply involved in the subsequent activities, and I'm, I do I'm, believe we need to be more aggressive, and I intend to be more aggressive. I'm asking for the all the people of America that depend on the FDA, the gold standard, of regulatory authority in the world, you're the point person. Now, obviously, there's thousands of people at the FDA, and you can't be personally responsible for each and every one of their actions, but, but in our form of government, you're the person that the President of the United States, confirmed by the Senate, is, is the leader. Are you upset with what this company did? Are you outraged? Are you confused? Are you puzzled i mean how do you feel i am deeply troubled okay. and i am committed to working with all of you with industry and with the states in order to assure that we have the regulatory framework that we need in order to be able to best protect the health of the american people and assure the safety of the all products right. we do not presently have that in place and i am worried that if we don't work together to address it there may be future problems of this magnitude. Okay, deeply troubled and worried. Okay, that's, I find that acceptable. Now, at our first hearing, there was a lot of ping pong balling back and forth, whether it was a state problem, a state regulatory problem, or a federal regulatory problem, and I believe you testified that you needed more authority, and, and there, was a, there was some ambiguity in the law, things like this. Since that time, you've shut the company down. There, I think there's a criminal case against the company. So obviously the FDA had enough authority to do what it has done. Do you today think that, that the authority is adequate on the books for your agency, or do you continue to believe that you need more authority? My understanding that it was the state authority that was able to – that the uh, NECC was licensed – by the state of Massachusetts, and it was the state authority that enabled um, the Well, but my question, to be taken my question away. is, knowing what you know now, do you still want this committee to to give the FDA additional authority, or are are you satisfied that you your agency, the FDA, has sufficient authority to do its job? We definitely need additional authorities. At the present time, compounding pharmacies under existing law, despite the ambiguities and the split court decision, compounding pharmacies are not required to register with us, so we don't know who they are and what they're making. They're not required. These large uh, compounding pharmacies that are making um, sterile products are not required in law um, 
to okay. So uh, you you think you need additional? Standard. I have my time's expired, and I have one more question that I want to ask. Do you do you feel that this company is typical of the average compounding pharmacy? You know, I cannot. There's an ongoing criminal investigation, as you know. I can't comment on the specifics, but there are good players and bad players out there compounding drugs. There are compounding plays a critical role in our health care system, but we need to make sure that there are the standards in place and that FDA has the authorities uh, to enforce those standards that will assure the quality and safety of these products, particularly these highest risk sterile products. Thank, I thank the, thank the commissioner and thank the chairman. Thank you. Mr. Wax was now recognized for five thank, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Hamburg, if a manufacturer wants to produce a drug, they have to go to FDA and get approval and show the drug is safe and effective. And you keep track of those manufacturers, you even inspect some of their facilities. Isn't that right? That is correct. So a compounding pharmacy can put together drugs, but they don't have to come to FDA to ask approval or even register with you to let you know that they're doing that. Isn't that correct? That is the case. They go to their states and have to uh, let the states know, or does that depend on state law? State laws are very variable, as well as the resources for enforcement. Well, some people have said that because recently you've gone out and done inspections uh, between February and April of this year of 30 compounding pharmacies that make sterile injectable drugs, uh, and uh, that there are inspections on occasion, that you have all the authority you need. Um, Dr. Hamburg and Mr. Taylor, can you say that you have the authority to be able to comprehensively oversee and inspect this industry that can act without your approval and maybe even in occasions you don't even know who they are? No, we, we as you note, know, don't have the authority to even know who's out there and what they're making. We don't have those uniform national standards for safe practices, good manufacturing practice, to inspect against and hold them to. They do not have to report adverse events that they might hear about uh, to us so we can respond rapidly. This is not a system that is adequate to protect in the light of this changing health care system and its needs and this evolving industry. The, uh The, the uh, inspections that you've done are, are, are based on what information? We determined who to uh, inspect based on either past awareness of concerns, public information about concerns, um, concerns states had brought to our attention, but we, we were inspecting companies that made sterile products because we view them as the highest risk. Um, and, you know, we have certainly found um, considerable concerns about ongoing sterility practices, and we've also found that um, even in light of recent events, that companies are questioning our authorities um, to do full inspections and the appropriateness of the inspections. When um, uh, FDA wanted to look at this NECC, the company that made the uh, drug that has done so much harm. In December of 2006, that was before you were there, FDA sent them a warning letter highlighting a series of violations of federal law, and this company responded in part that it didn't need FDA approval before dispensing compounded medications, and further, did not operate in a manner that would subject us to FDA regulation. In other words, they were resisting FDA doing its job uh, they were emboldened. Uh, didn't that make your job even tougher? Well, it certainly has made it tougher. It's made it um, much less effective and efficient, and I think it speaks to the reason why I'm here now really asking for the chance to work with you to put in place the systems of legal and regulatory requirements that will enable better cooperation that. and coordination. Now, if you find a pharmacy compounder and they're doing high risk work and you have some suspicions that there are problems and you want to do an inspection, can you get their records? We cannot always get their records. They Well, uh, 
you don't have the authority to get record inspections. Isn't that right? The reason I say that is that uh, uh, in, in, at the Senate in, hearing in November, the compounding industry witness said FDA doesn't need new records inspection authority because it can access pharmacy records by getting a warrant. Mr. Taylor, what does it mean you have to go get a warrant if you want to see their records? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's once, once a refusal has occurred, what you actually have to do is put together essentially an affidavit that you would take to court explaining why you are seeking this warrant. Then an FDA employee would, would testify to the, to the truth of the warrant, and then you actually have to bring it to a federal court judge. So it's, well, let me just stop you and say, if, if we want you to do your job, we've got to give you the tools. We've got to make the law clear. And one ought to be you can do inspections and you can get these records and not have to go through the whole rigmarole uh, where they want to fight you and have to go and get a warrant. Some cooperate, but some, especially those we're most suspicious of, can force you to go to court and get a warrant. Isn't that right? That's correct. Well, I hope we take that into consideration, Mr. Chairman, in addressing this question of uh, the law that needs to be uh, uh, adopted by the Congress. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman yields back. And now recognize Dr. Burgess for five minutes. I thank the Chairman for the recognition. Dr. Hamburg is always welcome back to our humble committee room here in the Energy and Commerce Committee. You know, I just have to say, reading through the information that was provided by your office that the staff has assembled, uh, I mean, your staff must be some of the most frustrated people in the world because it seems like they were always coming right up to the point where someone could pull the plug on NECC, on the New England Compounding Center, and then for whatever reason, they backed off. I don't know whether they were thrown off the scent or dissuaded by your lawyers. Um, you know, but you're, you're a doctor. You run a public health agency. Lawyer stuff is for lawyers. We're supposed to take care of people. We're supposed to prevent this stuff from happening. And the system was blinking red for 10 years. So I appreciate that there is a, a, a newfound enthusiasm and vigilance after the end of September of 2012. Everything seems to be a pre and post meningitis mindset at the FDA. And I'm grateful for the work that the agency is doing now. But I just fail to understand why you could not do that same work prior to the death of, of, of 50 people. It, it just, it, it almost defies gravity. In your own written testimony, you, you on the third page, beginning of the top of the page, you, you actually reference since the NECC outbreak. And then you go into a magnesium sulfate preparation that was contaminated, apparently with no injuries. Um, then you talk about uh, eye infections associated with repackaged Avastin. But that's not really new information because the FDA had received warnings and complaints relating to the sterility of NECC's of Aston products for a long time. Uh, 2007, the FDA was repeatedly put on notice that NECC may again be experiencing problems relating to the sterility and or safety of its products. An adverse drug reaction uh, uh, report, which was supplied by you to our committee, so uh, obviously, it was received by the by the FDA. Talked about just one of those eye infections that occurred after a repackaged, repurposed Avastin. Um, apparently, the company took a bulk amount of compound that was duly licensed for treatment of colon cancer, and broke it up into smaller amounts, and dispensed it to ophthalmologists for use in treating macular degeneration. The problem is, and has, has been referenced by, by your folks, every time you pierce that vial, uh, the risk for contamination occurs. So you make up multiple preparations that can now be used for intraocular injection, but uh, the last syringes that are prepared that day may have extra stuff in them. You cannot have a preservative to prevent the growth of bacteria or fungus in an Avastin preparation for ophthalmic use because it's going into the eye, and you can't have a preservative injected into the eye. So I guess what troubles me is you're, you're talking about it here, uh, the serious eye infections with repackaged Avastin, but that wasn't exactly news to you, was it? I think what you're speaking to underscores the fact that we really do now need to recognize that the existing legal authorities and enforcement strategy is not adequate to address the problems that we have. 
We need but to I, be able sorry, to hold the packages. I do need to interrupt you in the interest of time. Sanitary standards. Because you now are in those companies. I mean, in, in, your, in your own testimony, you talk about far, compounding pharmacies producing what should be sterile products, shipping across state lines, and if, in, in, in advance of or without a prescription. I'm not a lawyer. I don't really understand what a makes a manufacturer a manufacturer, but I feel like that old Supreme Court justice. I, I don't know the definition of manufacturer, but I know one when I see it, and that's a manufacturer. And you have absolute authority to regulate manufacture of pharmaceuticals, do you not? Yes. Yes, is the answer. Thank you for the direct answer to that question. And you're doing it now in the post-NECC environment, you're, and, and we're grateful for that enforcement activity. Mm -hmm. I just got to believe your folks at the various divisions within the agency, I mean, they had to be pulling their hair. In fact, we, we have the testimony of, uh, of one, uh, the, the, the fellow that's the, now the head of the whole New England district office, Mutahar Shansi. I mean, he said, why do we even inspect if we're not going to follow through on these things? They're doing all the work. They're getting right up to the point where, again, someone should pull the plug on the bad guys and they tell a cop to stand down. Don't, don't do it. Uh, that, your, your agency must be internally in turmoil because of this. We would very much like to have some of the same kinds of authorities that we have with conventional manufacturers with these highest risk uh, uh, compounders. We do not got, presently have them, and that's why we are seeking legislation. You have the authority f to regulate manufacturing. I mean, that is, no one is disputing that. That is not in question. You have that authority. In fact, if you don't believe you have that authority, Maybe somebody else ought to run the agency, but you have that authority. Of and that course be we do. Clean. But what I'm saying to you is we do not have the same authorities to regulate compounding pharmacies. If they and are if manufacturing, we... if they're engaged in manufacturing, I submit that you do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, maybe we can have time for a second round. Uh, thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingle. Mr. Chairman, I'm quite outraged. Here I sit. We're picking nits and straining at nets instead of addressing what this committee should be doing. We should be figuring out what are the problems and then to proceed to address them. We've had 733 cases, 53 deaths, 15 deaths in Michigan, the highest number of cases and the deaths. And we've, we're dealing here with an agency that doesn't have the authority to do the things that it needs to do. Section 503 exempts compounded drugs from three critical requirements of FDA. First of all, they don't have to comply with good manufacturing practices. And if you look what happened up in New England, you'll find they weren't even within rock throwing distance of good manufacturing practices. And so they have no authority to address these things as new drugs. They really have questionable, if any, authority to address the manu these people as manufacturers. And there is no requirement that these things have directions for proper use. In addition to this, these people who, who have vigorously opposed any kind of control have not only gotten themselves statutory exemption, but they don't even have to report adverse consequences of the use of their pharmaceuticals. And here we sit picking nits about what did food and drug know and when did they know it. This committee should be saying, what authority do you need? And then saying, by golly, we're going to get it for you. Now, let me ask you a few questions, Madam Administrator. Uh, you've said that you don't have sufficient authority to regulate these people. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Now, since the fungal meningitis outbreak, FDA has inspected compounding pharmacies that are known to have produced sterile drugs in the past. Is this correct? That is correct. Can you explain briefly what the Food and Drug Administration found during these inspections? We have found serious lapses in sterility uh, procedures, insufficient ventilation. I want you to submit that for the record, if you please. Now, was Food and Drug granted full access to all of the identified compounding pharmacies for inspection? Yes or no? No. Will you submit to us what it did? It was that they did to deny you that access. Now, was Food and Drug ad ad granted full access to records by all of the identified compounding pharmacies during inspection? No. Did you encounter resistance from uh, any of the identifying compounding pharmacies when food and drug arrived for inspection? 
Questioning of our authority, yes. yes. All right. Now, uh, would you please submit for the record what actually happened to you in these cases where they refused you access to the records? Now, Madam Administrator, even in light of the fungal meningitis outbreak with 53 deaths and over 700 confirmed cases, some of these compounding pharmacies refuse to grant you access to their facility or records for inspection. Yes or no? Yes. Do you need inspection authority to effectively regulate compounding pharmacies? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely. Do you believe that the states are able or have carried out their responsibilities fully on these matters? It's very variable, but, but no, not in their entirety. Okay. Do you believe that FDA has clear authority to access all records when inspecting a compounding pharmacy, yes or no? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Do you believe that FDA has clear authority to access all records when inspecting a compounding pharmacy, yes or no? No. Has FDA faced litigation regarding its ability to inspect records in pharmacies? Yes, we have. Do you need this authority to effectively regulate compounding pharmacies? Yes. Would these authorities help FDA to enter a compounding pharmacy without delay to conduct proactive inspections? Yes. Would these authorities assist FDA in preventing future outbreaks? Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, I want to make some observations here. This committee has an important responsibility. Our responsibility is to find out if the laws are being properly enforced and if there is additional law that is needed to, to make the situation better. We are having people who have been killed. We can anticipate if we don't do something more, there's going to be more. The Democratic members on this committee have sent to the leadership of this committee a request to bring in the, the trade association of, this people, of these people to discuss what it is they're doing and why and when and how. They have refused to assist and cooperate with food and drug. They have gone further and they have instructed their members as how to obfuscate, delay, and to refuse to comply. We have a nasty situation on our hands. Let's get down to addressing the problem that is before us. Let's haul the right people in. Let's get the right kind of legislation drafted. Let's get the proper testimony, and let's move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, by the way, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman Dingell has asked for a number of documents uh, for the record, and at the last hearing in November, uh, a number of members also asked for documents. We haven't received those yet, so um, I'd like to expect those records by the 19th of April to have answers to those 19th questions. 19th of April. For the, for the record. It's a Friday. The questions for the record from the last hearing. The questions for the record for the last hearing, which were, was in November. Uh, the chair now recognized for five minutes, gentlemen from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you having this hearing and following up on uh, something that we have been delving into for a few months now. Uh, I know I had asked, as others did, uh, back at that last hearing, uh, and I'll reiterate, I I'd like to get uh, whatever law it is that you all are hiding behind that says you do not have the legal authority uh, to investigate these pharmacies like uh, Ameridos and NECC. I, I don't know why we haven't gotten it in the months since our hearing, but uh, can you get us whatever it is that legally you're hiding behind that you say prevented you uh, from doing the proper investigation, things that you're saying you need to change the law now? Well, if you need to change the law now, then clearly you're hiding behind some section of law that you think doesn't allow you to do it today. Can you get us that information? I can certainly get you relevant law. I would just like to underscore that it is not just the FDA that is concerned about the ambiguity in the law. This has been a serious issue for a long time, going back to when it was first enacted, the statute 503A to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, when David Kessler sat before a committee and, and said that he was concerned that the law was going to create loopholes that would enable um, compounding pharmacies. But, but did, you just say, did you just say earlier in your testimony that, that you've gone and investigated over 50 uh, of these pharmacies since the outbreak? Because we've been able to go in and investigate or well, If you've been able to investigate. does not mean that we have the full authority. That so you're investigating need. without legal authority now? No, Is that we, what you think you're doing? We have the authority to, to go in, as, as Congressman Dingell just indicated. We don't have the full authorities we need 
um, in order to do the full inspection. Well, let me ask and you this. And we don't know who they we're are. We're limited on time. I apologize. But, but if we can first put up, uh, there is a, a chart that documents complaints that have been filed for months and months prior to the deaths uh, that, that y'all were receiving. FDA was getting complaints about this facility, not in general, but about this facility. Now, I don't know what y'all were doing about it back then, uh, but if you were claiming you didn't have the legal authority uh, to do it, and yet you're getting these complaints, did you at least pick up the phone and call the state of Massachusetts and ask them to use their legal authority to investigate? Mr. Chairman, I'd have to ask, does the witness have a list of those complaints? Because I certainly can't well, do, read it do you here. Do you know about those complaints? I'll ask the commissioner. They, they were... Those complaints, would, we got them because we got them from the FDA. Do you know that they're out there? I, I am aware that there were complaints. Okay. And, so did y'all pick up the phone the and call the state of Massachusetts? We have made an effort to follow up. Did you, in did you during, and, during the time prior to the 53 deaths, you're getting flooded with complaints from people saying this place is unsafe. It's highly questionable what they're doing. Did you at some point, when you, when you said in your own decision-making process that you didn't think you had the legal authority to go in and check them out, did you at least pick up the phone and say, no, I want to be clear, I did, health, not, call Massachusetts. I, I did not say we don't have authority. We have, have authority that is not adequate to fully regulate. The well, then, then why didn't you pick up the, the phone and call somebody who did if, if, in your opinion, you were concerned about your question on authority? Why didn't you call Massachusetts or did you call Massachusetts prior to the deaths? Occurring. We, yes, sir, that I mean, that's a yes or no question. Others have worked. We worked with Massachusetts, and we've. The, worked did with you other call the state of Massachusetts questions. and forward the complaints and say, "Look, there's a real serious question about this this company in your state. We're not sure if we can go in. Y'all ought to go in because you have the legal authority." Did you make Look, that call? Did you pass that information? I, I have yes or no? said that We're I do not believe here. that our response to the compounding industry um, and uh, specific issues that So did you forward any of these complaints? And this is a yes interest. or no question. Did you forward any of these complaints we, to the state of Massachusetts prior to the deaths? Any of them? In, in many instances, yes or no. we're working with the states. Did you forward the complaints? Yes or no? I can't speak to, I don't know what complaints you're referring know. to, but in, 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 well, in many instances, yes. We were. Yes, you did? Around... I, I don't know what Did you send you the complaints to, yes sir. or no? And I'm, I'm only trying to pressure. I mean, you, you were happy to a answer Mr. Dingle's questions, yes or no. I've got 40 seconds left. Did you forward any of these complaints that you got to the state of Massachusetts, yes or no? We discussed complaints. With yes the state. or no? We did inspections. Can you answer this in a yes or no fashion? Are you evading? I, I can't speak Let to me ask you this. I, I went to your website. I went to your website. This is right now live. Your website commissioner's page says that it's, your mission to find novel, quote, novel ways to prevent illness and promote public health and be transparent in explaining our decision making, says Dr. Hamburg. That's you. You are not, number one, you did not find novel ways to protect public health, and you're not right now being transparent in explaining your decision making process. So you're failing in your mission. So I'll, I'll at least ask well, you this. Maybe you I, can I'm not Has anybody at FDA been held accountable for the 53 deaths that occurred? Anybody? You know, we are working hard both in responding. Has anyone been held accountable? Yes or no? Or do you not know? You know, I, I, my statement to you is that we could have been more vigorous. but Has that anyone been held accountable? Gentlemen's time. Have you time. held anyone accountable? The buck stops with you. You said that today in your testimony. Gentlemen. Have you held anyone accountable for 53 deaths? This is a problem that is one that needs to be addressed. I'll take that as a no. FDA, I'll take that as a no, and I'll yield back time to the Now recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Tonko, for allowing me to go out of turn. Um, uh, Commissioner Hanberg, by the time the Obama administration entered office in January of 2009, FDA guidance and law regarding compounding pharmacies had been governed by confusion and uncertainty for nearly seven years. In May 2009, top FDA officials met with the acting commissioner, your predecessor, to resolve the issue of unregulated compounding pharmacies. I want to ask you about a document that the FDA produced to, uh, gave to the, the committee. You can find it at tab 45. It's a written summary of a meeting that occurred on May 12, 2009. This summary of the meeting noted that, quote, 
Unregulated compounding raises significant public health concerns. FDA has seen numerous examples of serious patient injury and death caused by improper compounding, unquote. At this meeting, the recommended path forward was to seek legislation amending Section 503A to enhance FDA's oversight of compounded drugs, much, uh, I guess, like you are saying now to, to do that. But this document also lists a disadvantage of that legislative approach. And the summary stated, the, the legislative process will be time and resource intensive, and the compounding community will actively oppose the changes that we seek. They have a very effective grassroots organization that will make the, it difficult for us to achieve our legislative ends. We cannot know if the result of our efforts will be better law than Section 503A in its current form, unquote. So, Dr. Hamburg, this was not a meeting that you, that you attended, and I'm not going to ask you about it specifically, but I would like to ask you a question about the influence of the compounding industry generally and its leading trade group, the International Academy of Compounding Pharmacies, or IACP. Can you describe the general views of the compounding industry with regard to the FDA authority that you're talking about requesting today? Well, I think it's clear that that organization and the industry more broadly has over many years questioned our authorities to fully regulate um, the compounding pharmacies. They have challenged us in court, has, has been documented. And in addition to questioning FDA authorities, as was demonstrated in the document that was, was put together um, by uh, uh, Congressman Waxman and others, they also were making concerted efforts to weaken uh, regulatory authorities at the state level. Um, and I think that, that this was even while recognizing that this could lead to some serious concerns. And certainly it has made our ability to regulate this industry much more challenging. It has, has required um, much more complexity in terms of, of the actions we can take and the resources required to take those actions. And it has certainly also thwarted earlier efforts at legislation. In 2007, Senator Kennedy's Burr, Kennedy, Burr, and Roberts um, proposed some legislation that would have strengthened the FDA role and clarified some of these issues and industry was up on the hill lobbying intensively and that legislation was never introduced and I don't believe there was anything on the hill, the House side either. So then would you say that the IACP has made it more difficult for FDA to effectively regulate drug compounders? I would. And would you agree that the compounders have traditionally been adamantly opposed to any expansion of FDA authority over drug compounders? Absolutely, and I think the industry is questioning the inspections that we are doing now. So, Dr. Hamburg, earlier this week, the subcommittee uh, released a letter asking that a representative of compounding pharmacies be invited here today, but the majority rejected our request. I'd like to ask that the letter and underlying documents, all of which show that the compounding industry has fought relentlessly to avoid FDA oversight, be added to the hearing record. Thank you. I think this proceeding would have benefited from, the, from hearing their testimony. Our drug supply needs to have FDA oversight and drug compounders shouldn't get to, create, to, to evade regulation by the agency. We as a committee need to join together and finally give the FDA, give you the authority that you need, that the agency needs to effectively oversee drug compounders. And I yield back. Generally yields back and I recognize uh, Mr. Olson for five minutes. I thank the chair and welcome Dr. Hamburg. As you know, ma'am, one of my duties as an elected representative of the people of Texas 22 is to provide oversight and investigate the executive branch to ensure that they comply with the Constitution and the laws. Put simply, my job is to find the truth. The truth is that 55 Americans died because their spinal injection was contaminated, and at least 700 Americans were made seriously ill by the, that drug. These families deserve to know the truth, and I intend to get that for them. 
During your testimony in November, you made a number of statements about how the compounding industry has evolved in recent years. You also highlighted that the Massachusetts State Pharmacy Board was in the best position to oversee NECC. But that decision was made in 2003. Is that correct? As I think you probably know, compounding pharmacies historically have been regulated by states, and it is the states that license um, pharmacies. Yes, ma'am. These are complaints. Please refer to tabs two and three in your binder there. Give some time to do that. These are complaints about the NECC from pharmacists in Wisconsin and Iowa that the Massachusetts Pharmacy Board forwarded to FDA in April and May of 2004. In an email to the Massachusetts Board related to the second complaint in tab three, the lead attorney for the board asked, could you clarify what we may not have known about their operation previously that this email tells us, as in what the FDA might not know in their prior assessment that the NECC was not a, quote, manufacturer, end quote. Commissioner Hamburg, a different picture of NECC began to emerge soon after the FDA decided the state should take the lead. Isn't that right? Much different picture, ma'am, much different. It, as I think was discussed at the last hearing, uh, it was agreed during this early period that, in fact, the state of Massachusetts had the lead in responding because uh, it was a licensed pharmacy in Massachusetts. However, I think it's important to underscore that the line between compounder and manufacturer is not a bright one and that that's part of what we're seeking is to get more explicitness in law with respect to what is a manufacturer and what is a compounder. Yes, ma'am, but these documents show that by 2004, soon after the FDA's decision that the state would take the lead in overseeing NECC, FDA had already begun to receive information showing that the company was shipping products across the country without patient-specific prescriptions. Based on documents provided, pharmacists and hospitals continued to forward NECC solicitations to you, to the FDA. Let me give you one example. It's tab four there in your binder. In January of 2006, the FDA received a complaint about NECC soliciting a multiple-use sterile injectable product. Are you familiar with this complaint, ma'am? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. This complaint stated that NECC does, and this is a quote, not need or desire to have the patient's name, end quote. This would suggest that the company is no longer acting like a compounder, right? It's not filling patient-specific prescriptions. Recently, a 60 Minutes report in which you inter were interviewed, a NECC anonymous informant claimed the company was forging patient prescriptions. Are you familiar with that charge, ma'am? Yes or no? You know, with respect to some of these specific documents, et cetera, because of the ongoing criminal investigation, I discussed this with the chairman before, you know, I cannot characterize um, this situation for you. We all want that criminal investigation to go forward, and I do not want to do or with say all due something respect, that would compromise you are not that. the subject of an open investigation. This committee has not sought any documents from the FDA or the U.S. Attorney's Office that are being used in an open criminal case. By definition, we are not asking any questions about the open case or evidence that is part of that case. This Congress does not necessarily have your respect for a quote-unquote open criminal case. That excuse. 30 years ago, in the Reagan administration, this committee and other committees in the House held EPA Administrator and Gorsuch in contempt for not producing documents, even though Administrator Gorsuch was advised by the Department of Justice and the White House that she could not produce the, to the Congress the, these documents because of executive privilege. Please give us these documents. Again, I don't think open case applies. It hasn't historically. It shouldn't apply here. You clearly have a huge number of documents, but I cannot speak to the specifics of some of these documents because of the ongoing criminal investigation. I don't know the specifics of what is 
I'm not part of the ongoing criminal investigation in terms of the collection of information and its analysis, but I have been told that I need to be careful not to compromise that investigation. Not to sub the investigation, and we've not sought any documents from FDA Mr. or the U.S. Gentleman's time has expired. This, this investigation. Yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. I would respectfully ask that members, um, uh, I'd ask unanimous consent to ask Commissioner Hamburg, were you, were you advised by counsel not to answer questions about the ongoing criminal investigation? I, I was. And so, Mr. Chairman, I would ask what? members not to ask those if she if if she's been advised by counsel not to do that. I don't want to hurt a criminal investigation of a company that has killed 55 people and sickened hundreds more. And I'm going to assume no one else does. Yet. Well, um, I'm assuming you'll be able to show us a letter of uh, from the attorney general or someone's office saying you cannot speak to certain subjects here, so we know exactly where. You can and cannot. Can you show us some documentation? Well, I, I, I don't have such a letter, but I, I, I was advised that I should be very careful about not compromising the criminal investigation, and I think we all share that concern. None of us want to imperil the important criminal investigation that's ongoing. Appreciate that. We'll make sure we ask questions relevant to what you did and didn't do and what the FDA is responsible for in this. Uh, uh, thank you. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, the uh, first, thank you for appearing before the uh, committee, uh, Dr. Hamburg, and thank you for your service as commissioner at FDA. Um, it's been well documented that um, the FDA has been stepping up its inspections of compounding pharmacies uh, in the wake of uh, tragedies. Um, and while that's a first good step, um, can you Tell us which, um, which additional efforts you need. What follow-up um, intervention would and should be available uh, as the next tools in the, in the kit to do your job and do it effectively? Well, thank you for that question. We do feel that we want to be more aggressive, and to do that, there are some critical gaps in our authorities. First of all, we need these companies that are making the highest risk products, the sterile products, in advance of or without a prescription and shipping them interstate. They need to be held to a, a national uniform standard for safety practice and good manufacturing that, that they will adhere to, that we can inspect against, and that we can take enforcement actions against that will hold. They need to be required to register with us so that we can even know who's out there and what they're making. Um, and we certainly want them also to report adverse events to us if they hear about them in relation to a product so that we can get in quickly and try to mitigate that problem as fast as possible. Thank you. The, um, the partnership, the interrelationship with the state authorities, um, are there requirements for them to inform the FDA as to findings, uh, does the ball rest in your court to approach them? Are they required? Is there a registry of sorts that requires them to update you routinely? Is that structured? Yeah. Is it standardized? A very important question. As you know, states historically have regulated compounding pharmacies as they do the practice of pharmacy in general, and states have very different laws with different requirements. But as far as I know, there is not any specific requirements on reporting uh, to the FDA. We often work in concert with states, and that's important, and we sometimes piggyback on their authorities when we are going into facilities um, and, for example, trying to get access to records which we might be denied. Um, going forward, we feel very strongly that we need to strengthen the working relationships with the state and systematize some of the, the mechanisms for communication um, because that will make a difference. In these recent inspections that we've just done, we did do them in almost all the cases in coordination with the states. Uh, it seems to me that, you know, there was a lot of talk as to um, what intervention there was or what interaction there might have been between FDA and the states. It seems to me there's an added safety net offered if there's a structured, standardized requirement of states to inform um, good and bad news being shared with you uh, about their 
um, oversight uh, and the given authority that they now have. I think that would improve the system. Um, and also you asked about the explicitness of some of the, uh, the details uh, that guide your day-to-day -day operations in these matters. Are there other things you would bring to this committee's attention that uh, would be useful and uh, provide for perhaps uh, more public safety here and consumer protection? Well, I think, you know, what is just abundantly clear, and it's demonstrated in the documents that we've given to you, is that, that we have been compromised in our ability to provide the full and aggressive enforcement that I think is necessary to protect the health of the American people, that we have an ambiguous statute. We have a statute that is complicated by differing court opinions um, that reflect the ambiguity that even federal courts can't agree about what the law is and how it should be applied. Um, and that just is not a system that serves anyone, and that's overlaid on the fact that all of the states have different laws and practices. So we do not have the kind of strong um, regulatory system that really can assure safety and get patients the products that they need. In addition, the statute doesn't fit the current health care environment, patient needs, hospital needs. It's simply the wrong fit. And we have an opportunity, I think we have an obligation now to work with all of you to try to make sure that we have the kind of regulatory program in place, the kinds of laws that we can really build on and enforce against. Well, I appreciate the, um, that effort, and I, I would hope that uh, we gather this information and go forward and do the work that's essential to respond to, uh, in the aftermath of these tragedies, to the needs of the general public. So thank you again for um, your information here today. Thank you. Right now, recognize I yield the, back. the gentleman yields back. We now recognize for five minutes the gentleman of Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Dr. Hamburg, while the circuits may disagree on some aspects of the law, isn't it correct that in order to be a, compounded, a compounding pharmacy, you're supposed to be making something for a specific patient with a specific uh, uh, prescription? Isn't that true? Well, in fact, yes many or no. states allow anticipatory compounding and I'm talking about the off. code, that the, the federal code. And isn't it true that for federal purposes, it's supposed to be a specific prescription and a specific patient. Yes. That is. All right, now let's move on to uh, the sister of uh, the sister company of NECC Emeridos because they also had problems and you all received, uh, FDA received information about those problems at Emeridos in 2009, 2010, 2011 from internal company sources. Isn't that correct, yes or no? That is correct. And... Uh, the concerns that were raised related to the safety of the products and practices at Emeridos, but also the company's management. Isn't that also correct? Yes. And isn't it correct that you all were alerted by uh, the folks in Ohio that there was actually a question that they didn't have these prescriptions for individual patients, but in fact were manufacturers, and Ohio was asking you all to look into this and trying to decide whether they were going to issue a cease and desist letter. Isn't that also correct? You know, again, I apologize, but we are getting into the area of an ongoing investigation. And I'm, I'm asking you if it's a fact whether you gave information to this committee, and I want it out there in the public so everybody out in the United States knows, you all received information. I'm not asking you whether it was true or not, but you received information from the state of Ohio that they felt like what they were looking at with Emeridos was a manufacturer, not a prescriber. Isn't that correct? I mean, excuse me, not a compounder. Because they didn't have specific prescriptions. You received that information, yes or no? You know, I, I actually cannot speak to that specific um, document. Um. So you were unaware that this information had come to, to the attention of the FDA, that Ohio was very concerned about this. All right, I'm going to move on. Are you aware that there were notes that were, in, that were involved in these complaints and concerns about whether or not there was going to be an investigation and that one of those notes, and I would point you to tab 26, go to the second part where it starts listing out things, and it says in note, I believe I've got this right here, on page 4, 
Note 4, specifically part of the inspection was to read, are written prescriptions slash physician orders for identified individual patients received before dispensing compounded injectable products each time they are dispensed. That's part of one of your own memos, is it not? And Mr. Taylor, if you want to jump in here, it might be your memo, but it's an FDA memo. Yes or no? The issue about prescriptions is one that, that has been an area of, of ambiguity in terms of whether 503A applies or not, et cetera, and it's been well, you know, part of this changing landscape in there, terms there of There was an inspection request, and as a part of that inspection request attached to that, was background information and what you ought to do, and one of those was to look into that information. But you all never did that with Ameridos, did you? Before the NECC problem, their sister company w was discovered through the deaths of American citizens, and 1,415 people in my region of the state of Virginia and a little bit over into West Virginia were impacted by these drug companies or these manufacturers posing as compounders, you never asked for that information. The FDA never did that, did they? As I said, there is an ongoing investigation by the FDA with respect to Meridos, and we are... All right. You never held an inspection. Yes. We, we have inspected Meridos on a number of occasions, but I, I cannot speak to the specifics. All right. And there were numerous requests to inspect both the Meridos and NECC. And as these inspection requests came in, you all sometimes, you answered earlier that to get a warrant might take you days or weeks. But isn't it true that on several occasions when, the, when NECC wrote you back and said, we don't think you have authority, you took two years before you even sent them a letter back? Isn't that not also true? As I've said, you know, I wish that we had been And I appreciate prompt, that. And I do appreciate the answers today much better. My time's running out, ma'am, so I'm going to move on. I do appreciate it. I understand that you're now going to be more aggressive. But in order to fix this, we have to figure out where the problems are. And when you have two-year delays, when somebody just sends you a letter and says, hey, we don't think you have authority, that's not acceptable. I believe that we've got to figure out what the problems were, not just at NECC, but across the board. I believe there are a lot of companies out there posing, perhaps, as compounders who are really manufacturers. And I think if you insisted on the, the requirement that there be a prescription for a specific patient or that the compound be made for a specific patient, like it was for my son on one occasion, then we wouldn't have had this problem in the first place. And I think you all failed the American people. Jim and Yields back. Uh, now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, thank you, Dr. Hamburg, for coming back. And I remember the hearing that we had earlier. And uh, I. I have to admit, having been on the committee for a long time, I didn't think the FDA uh, was um, something we could be proud of then because of what my colleagues on uh, the other side have talked about. Since the fungal meningitis outbreak was traced back to the so-called compounding pharmacy in Massachusetts, always seen as finger pointing uh, from the FDA, the industry, Republicans, Democrats, even states uh, have played this role. And it's time the finger pointing in and we begin to legislate. Um, and I've always supported community-based compounding pharmacies because historically that's how pharmacy started. And, uh, but I was shocked at what was going on in Massachusetts was considered the same type of silly as my neighborhood compounder who's filling a prescription from his phys a physician. Um, or even a larger pharmacy that supplies hospitals or large practices or even a heavy client load. And I know the FDA is requesting additional authority from, from Congress to regulate certain compounding pharmacies. I also know that that was your testimony previously, but in the meantime, you've been able to open up that investigation. So you can see why from our side of this, it looks like maybe the FDA did have some authority and just didn't use it. Uh, but I also know that if in a legal uh, situation, you probably need some background or, or some support based on changing the law. But I don't want you not doing what you're doing right now, and I know you've opened some investigations. So somewhere along the way, one of your attorneys said, we can do this now. Um, and I guess they didn't tell you that two years ago or whenever. Is that correct? I want to be clear that I never said we didn't have authorities. I said our authorities were limited. And we are determined to be as aggressive as possible using our current authorities, but they are not adequate to provide the American people with the safety protections that they need. And our current round of inspections are, I think, underscoring that fact that we cannot have an inspectional system in a regulatory regime 
where the, the very players that are at the center of the questions don't even have to register with us, don't even have to well, let us know what And I agree, uh, but what the FDA is requesting the authority, uh, is it over all compounders, including the ones who are, who are not regularly regu regulated by the states, particularly like a local compounding pharmacist who just does prescriptions? Does the FDA want to get into that, or do you want to look at the manufacturing and only go across state lines? Traditional compounding of the corner pharmacy type you're describing, I think, has a very important role in our healthcare system, and we all recognize that. We are concerned about this evolving new hybrid of compounding pharmacy that is making sterile high-risk products um, in advance of or without a prescription and uh, selling um, across state lines. We do believe we need new authorities in order to adequately regulate them. Again, they provide an important service to our healthcare system. Hospitals depend on the products that they make, and if done right, well, they can make and that's, those products uh, safe. That's one of my concerns, and I'm going to run out of time, and you know our time limits. Uh, as we write legislation, we should keep in mind that your intent is to, uh, to try to keep the compounding pharmacies in the, uh, if it's locally in the domain of state regulators. But, for example, in Texas, we have a great medical center in Houston, and I'm assuming they have a contract with some type of compounding company that, whether it's across state lines or not, that they may work with, but that compounding company is using prescriptions from this medical center or this hospital system or this practice of doctors. Um, you don't intend to go as far as for someone that has a prescription from either a group of doctors to a compounding pharmacist. We appreciate the tradition and the importance of traditional compounding. We do think that there are some requirements that should apply to all compounders, big or small, um, traditional, non-traditional. For example, there are certain products that probably should not be compounded by pharmacies no matter what. They should be made by manufacturers with a new drug approval process to assure safety and efficacy products that are complex and involve, you know, hard to dele deliver kinds of mechanisms, et cetera. We also believe that FDA um, approved commercially available drugs. Okay. Um, I hate to cut you off, but I want to ask, give you a chance to ask a question. This additional inspections that you're doing now, or the additional authority, uh, does the FDA have the capacity to expand on that considering the funding uh, flow that you already have? Are you going to be able to find the money to do that uh, even if Congress continues with sequestration, which looks like we are, but also with the current appropriations process? It's an enormous concern in terms of the expansion of responsibilities. Already we are responsible for overseeing some 5,600 conventional manufacturers. It's estimated there are about 28,000 um, compounding uh, pharmacies overall, probably um, 7,500 or so specialty pharmacists, and about 3,000 that are doing sterile compounding. Mr. Chairman, my time's, I'm out of time and I understand. I have one more question I'd like to submit, if we could submit a question, particularly dealing with the Texas, uh, uh, an incident in Texas with, uh, uh, but I'd like to submit that too if we have permission to do that. Yes, and we probably are going to be doing a second round too. If you're still here, you can ask that directly. Okay, if we do a second round, I'll be back. Okay. Now, can I ask the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Ms. Hamburg, you said in a response to uh, our colleague, Mr. Tonko, uh, a little while ago that you want compounding pharmacies to report adverse, rep adverse events so we can mitigate them as, as fast as possible. Would you please explain uh, briefly, what is an adverse event report? An adverse event report is when uh, someone submits to the FDA a, a concern about a product. It doesn't mean that actually there, there is a legitimate or ultimately verified uh, concern, but it, it is that there seems to have been some negative reaction associated with the product. Okay. Well, the FDA made a decision in 2011 to suspend inspections of compounding pharmacies until the agency could issue guidance on compounding and manufacturing, right? That's what you've testified to thus far. Yeah. Uh, that's a yes. Yes. Correct? You know, it's a bit more complicated than that, is it? No, no, it was a very simple question. We, you, the FDA made a decision in 2011 to suspend inspections of compounding pharmacies until the agency could issue guidance on compounding and manufacturing. We were doing right? four-cause inspections when we learned about a, a problem. Of well, 
I want to talk about certain adverse event reports that came in to the agency about Emeritus after this decision to suspend inspections were made. Uh, the agency produced these reports to us but didn't produce any documents showing how the agency responded to them. So let me run through them. Uh, they're located, uh, the complaints are located in your binder starting at tab 40. We know that the FDA didn't conduct any inspections of, Mer of Emeritus from 2011 until the outbreak. Is that, is that accurate? Is that correct? After 2011, I, I do not believe we did an inspection. Okay. Um, I want to determine what the FDA did with these reports, including sharing the information with the state or investigating them. On November 17, 2011, uh, FDA received an adverse infant event report associated with three pregnant women in labor having to have C-section since the epidural injections of an Emeritus made uh, fentanyl product were not working. Did the FDA take any action on that adverse event report? My understanding is that we we were in there inspecting. We did. No, I'm not asking if you were in there inspecting. Event. I asked, did the FDA take any action on that adverse event report? You testified earlier that you want to mitigate them as fast as possible. So these have a sense of urgency to them in your own opinion. Did the FDA take any action on that report that came in on November 17th? I, I can't speak to Would you get that back to the that. record? Will, I will get back. Okay. To on January 24th, 2012, FDA received an adverse event report associated with Ameridose made fentanyl injections. This time, the complaint related to confusing labeling resulting in two near misses. Uh, where nurses had stated that they almost gave their patients 100 milligrams instead of 50 milligrams. What action did the FDA take in that case? I would like to get back to you on that. Okay, submit that one for the record as well, please. Can I have your commitment on that? To submit that one to the record? Yes. Okay. Uh, the next day... On January 25th, 2012, FDA received an adverse event report involving an Emeritus made heparin uh, four bags that a hospital administered to patients, only for the hospital staff to determine after several tests that the bags contained no heparin. Uh, what did the uh, FDA respond to that adverse event report? Again, it would be very helpful to me because of the ongoing FDA investigation. They're in your tab, I'm, I'm uncertain, um, you know, what would be harmful for me to say. Plus, no, did, did, what, did I, the, I, what did the FDA do in response to that uh, adverse event report, if anything? It, you know, I, I Get that back for the record also. The adverse event report. Looks like we're striking out here. My time, is, my time is limited, ma'am, because I have several others here. Yeah. On March 12, 2012, the FDA uh, received another adverse event report involving potency issues with the Meridos made fentanyl products at tab 43. Any response by the FDA? I would like to get back okay. to because I, I would appreciate that. To the Less than two weeks later, accident. on March 23rd, 2012, the FDA received yet another report involving another hospital close call associated with confusing Emeritus labeling. That's at tab 44. I'm out of time, so I'll ask you to get me responses back, the committee responses back on all of those, please. Gentleman yields back. The uh, chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Long of Missouri for five minutes. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Dr. Hamburg, for being here today. I know this hadn't been real easy, and uh, Mr. Taylor, for your assistance. The uh, president stepped to the microphone yesterday and said uh, that at a time like this with the Boston attack yesterday, that we're not Democrats and we're not Republicans, we're Americans. And I think when a situation like this NEC situation with the FDA comes up, but that's how we need to approach things, is as Americans, and try and get to the bottom of this and see what you can do to be helpful to us and what we can do to be helpful to you. And uh, back in, uh, do you remember the first time, well, when was the first time you were apprised of the fact that uh, warning signals or warning flags had been raised about the activities of the 
New England Compounding Center. You know, as, as I think I said before, as Commissioner, I am not aware of every enforcement action that's being taken, every complaint that comes in. And so, you know, unfortunately, I was not aware of many of the facts um, that are now before us. Uh, well, I'm just asking the first time that you occurred. The first time you were apprised of this, I mean, was it on a newscast or how were you made aware of the serious problem? You know, I, I became aware of NECC when the first reports of the meningitis outbreak um, began to emerge. At, which was you know, approximately? Which was in the fall of 2012. And, you know, we began to work very uh, quickly with our colleagues at the state um, level and with the CDC to try to understand the nature of the, the contamination and uh, what could be done to address it and to make sure that appropriate actions were taken. Prior, prior to that time, had you all ever inspected the facilities of NEC? Had the FDA ever been in there and done any inspections? Yes, there had been inspections. What type of inspections? I mean, what, do, what were they inspecting for? I mean, is this something where you would monitor for such things as mold, or do you do microscopic tests, or what kind of inspections would you conduct? Well, I think, you know, we, we were not doing routine inspections because NECC was being regulated by the state of Massachusetts as a licensed pharmacy. Um, but over the course of history, we were in there for various reasons in response to specific complaints of product contamination or adulteration or misbranding. Did you know they were bad actors then? I mean, would you have considered them a bad actor from your prior you know, This is the experience? area that I cannot address because of the ongoing criminal investigation. But you have no letter or anything from justice or anyone telling you not to speak you know, here openly today about, to I, answer our question, you know, I guess. I think none of us would want to compromise the importance of that criminal investigation and what... Well, we, we, don't, we don't want to compromise the American public either. And we've no, had 53 and I, deaths and we have 700 and some that are uh, ill now with it um, might lead to their demise. There's another, I think Morgan Griffith said there's 1,400 and some just in his district along, alone. So, uh, but back on April, in fact, it's been two years and one day ago, Colorado issued a cease and desist order to the New England compounding company or whatever the last C is on there uh, for shipping drugs to states without requiring individual prescriptions for each drug. Back then, two years ago, prior to 2012 and this outbreak, what, in there somewhere you all called off the dogs for a year. At what point was that? Well, I think you were referring to a cease and desist order that had happened from Colorado. Um, based on Colorado state pharmacy law. Right, right, but that didn't raise any red flags to you all that... Uh, you know, as we've discussed, states have very different laws with respect to um, what they will allow in their states and what also they will uh, license uh, pharmacists and pharmacies to do, and we, we did view that as a matter of, of state law fundamentally. Well, uh, you said earlier in your testimony that we needed legislation, and legislation takes a little while in this town. And uh, while we're waiting for this legislation, what are you doing in the interim to uh, prevent this from happening again or continuing to happen? Or there may be other compounding facilities out there as we speak with mold in their facility along with other things. What are you doing now? Well, I'm deeply concerned that we could have another tragedy, and that's why I really am hoping we'll be able to work with you on new legislation. But in the meantime, we are going to apply our current authorities as adequately as we can, recognizing that they're limited, that they don't allow us to know everyone who's out there and what they're making. They don't allow us to have a clear, uniform set of standards that are enforceable in law um, for uh, these highest risk uh, compounders to adhere to and that we are being challenged every day about our authorities in terms of uh, the industry believing that we we are overstepping that we don't have authorities and we know we need changes in the law in order to really be able to proactively um, provide the kind of regulatory framework that will prevent problems from happening in the first place rather than responding after the Short pandemic. of having new legislation, are you satisfied that your agency is doing everything possible now to protect 
the American public in the interim, because like I said, it takes forever and a day to get new Gentlemen's legislation yeah. done in this town, particularly when one side of the aisle refers to the other side of the aisle, and then that side of the aisle refers to their friends on the other side of the aisle. Like I said, I want to go back to my opening statement that I think we need to all work as Americans for a solution here and forget this malarkey about uh, each side of the aisle. I think this is one time right. that we Thank need you. to pull together because there's been a lot of people, that uh, families that have been uh, crushed by prepared. this, and we need to prevent this in the future. Thank I yield you. back what time I don't have. <laughs> Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Now recognize the gentlewoman uh, from North Carolina, Ms. Elmers, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, Dr. Hamburg, for coming today. Um, I, I do have many questions, um, and, and, but most importantly, I'd, I'd like to say that I am, I'm incredibly confused by your testimony. Um, and uh, because I'm confused, I would like to try to, to break this down into very, very simple terms. And I'd like for you to answer as if you were answering to one of the 53 families who are now without their loved one as a result of, of these actions that have taken place. You continuously contradict yourself on what the FDA knew, what the FDA did not know, what the FDA passed on to the state, what the FDA did not pass on to the state, and then when you find yourself in a corner, you say that you cannot respond because of the ongoing criminal investigation. So let's, let's try to get to the bottom of it in, in very simple terms. Because I, there again, one minute you were going in for inspections, and then the next minute you were not going in for inspections. One minute you understand that there were um, complaints filed, and then the next moment you did not know that there were complaints filed. I don't understand how, how we can get to the bottom of this situation. And furthermore, I would like to say that I don't understand how more legislation and regulation and authority is going to help this situation when the FDA did not apply what they already had. That, that seems to be very confusing to me because the, the authority that was there, the authority that you had to, to share information with the state obviously did not take place. Did, were there complaints that the FDA received shared with the state? Yes or I, no? In some cases. But what you asked me to speak to the, the There are a number of, of incidents of complaint there from, I think, starting in 2002 all the way to 2012. Which of those complaints were shared with the state? Now, mind you, I understand. You, you, in your testimony, you said here that you worked very quickly with our colleagues at the state level. How did you work with the state level when this went on for 10 years? You know, I think the critical point that I want to make to you and would make to the, the families and their victims is that I wish that the FDA Okay, that is the third time aggressive. you have used the term, but, I wish. I bet that those families wish you had acted as well. Now, let, let me go on to my, to my questioning, because, again, I'm, I'm so confused as to what authority you have, what authority you don't have, how you have, you have worked with the state, because they are the licensure of, of you know, these pharmacies and compounding pharmacies slash manufacturers. Um, it, you know, we, we keep getting into this gray area, and that seems to be your reasoning for, for inaction. Um, I have some documentation in front of me, um, some from, from your previous, uh, from the previous hearing that took place, of which I was not here. I am a new member to the Energy and Commerce um, Committee. And basically, it said at, at the last hearing in your written statement, you pointed to the fact that the state had inspected NECC in 2011 and found the facility to be, quote, satisfactory. Commissioner Hamburg, when did FDA first become aware of the inspection by Massachusetts Board of Pharmacy that had taken, taken place? Did you know about this? I was not aware of it personally until preparing uh, for the hearing. So it but, was... But let, let me say that, I'm, you know, it's not surprising that you are confused because 
Even federal judges have been confused about... We're not, we're, we're not going to talk about federal judges today. We are going to talk about the FDA. We are going to talk about your role and your responsibility. Was, the, was that in preparation, this, this inspection, was that in preparation for the November hearing? Was there preparation? Yes. Okay. Did you know that the state's inspection you cited was announced and conducted solely in connection with the renovation of NECC and had, had been t taken under, um, that inspection had taken place not as a follow-up to previous violations, but pursuant to, or the complaints, but because they were actually under renovation? My understanding, but this is really a question for the state, is that as part of their licensure as a compounding pharmacy in Massachusetts, they needed to um, have the state come in to do an inspection. And they said they that were, they were satisfactory. And that was where they were, and I think that was the facility where subsequently these products were um, being made. And it, was, and it was called satisfactory? It was a state inspection, but okay. that's my... All right, I'm, I'm looking forward to the second round of questioning. Thank you. They can now recognize Mr. Harper for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you are likely aware, CMS recently modified its billing methodology for compounding pharmacies providing drugs used in implanted pain pumps. This change jeopardizes access to necessary pain medications for some of Medicare's most vulnerable beneficiaries. Even more, this change, prohibiting compounding pharmacies from billing Medicare directly, eliminates an important accreditation requirement designed to protect patient safety. Pharmacies billing Medicare directly for these drugs must comply with Medicare supplier standards and federal regulations such as U.S. Pharmacopoeia 797. These standards provide an additional layer of quality promotion and patient safety for compounding pharmacies and dispensing sterile products for use in implanted pain pumps. On the other hand, pharmacies which sell their compounded products to physicians, clinics, or hospitals are not required to be accredited since they do not bill Medicare directly. In light of the recent tragedy relating to a pharmacy which appears to have been acting outside of its licensure, I believe it's critical that CMS and FDA encourage models of care that promote patient safety. Saying this, do you find it concerning that CMS, in the wake of a tragic outbreak, is encouraging pharmacies to sell drugs directly to physicians as opposed to billing Medicare directly and complying with quality accreditation standards? You know, I am, I am really not an expert on the CMS policy in this regard. Um, and so I think, I mean, many aspects of your question are probably best directed towards CMS, but with respect to um, the FDA uh, role, uh, I'd like to be able to, to look at, at the question you've asked and, and get back to you. Would you be willing to, to look into that situation? And if you are indeed concerned about that, would you be willing to express your concern to CMS about that? Yes. Okay. In September 2008, the head of the FDA New England office, uh, Mr. Uh, Shamsi, emailed a senior FDA compliance officer, Ms. Otter, and asked to do a new inspection of NECC due to concerns about sterile injectables. Now, sterile injectables are difficult drugs to make, am I correct? That's correct. Some have questioned whether compounding pharmacies should even make these drugs, am I correct? Some have, yes. Uh, at the time the request for a new inspection was made, the 2006 warning letter was still pending because FDA hadn't replied to NECC's response to the warning letter. I'd ask if you would refer in your notebook to tab 19, if you could look at that. Tab 19. In this email from October 1, 2008, Mr. Shamsi, the current head of the FDA district office, emailed Ms. Otter, a senior compliance officer, and asked whether, and quote, our lack of response would hinder any further action against NECC, close quote. Mr. Shamsi believed the FDA lawyer in the chief counsel's office would be reluctant to approve an injunction if they hadn't replied to NEC's response to the warning letter. It seems like FDA staff 
uh, were considering serious, it seems like if they were, the FDA staff were considering serious enforcement actions like in joining the company, but a breakdown in process was preventing the agent, the agency from taking decisive action. Is that a correct statement? As I said before, we should have been more prompt, but it, it is the case that during that period, there was a series of court decisions that were altering the landscape with respect to the application of, of relevant uh, legislation with respect to FDA authorities. And that was, unfortunately, slowing our response. I hope that we will not be in that situation again going forward. That is why I am here really saying that we do need strengthening and clarification of our regulatory authorities. We do need new laws that will enable us to, to be able to provide the clear, consistent, and uniform um, regulatory oversight and action with these compounding pharmacies that are making, as you point out, the higher risk sterile products. So in that situation, no matter the risk, uh, FDA was not willing to do anything. The, you know, again, I am a little bit uncertain about, you know, how much detail to speak to because of the ongoing criminal investigation. Okay. The ongoing criminal uh, investigation, which you have nothing in writing advising you of constraints for that, correct? You've said that. There's nothing in writing. Do you have anybody here from the, uh, from the U.S. Attorney's Office that's here with you today to advise you on which questions to answer or not answer? No, I don't. Has there been any communication from the U.S. Department of Justice to this committee advising you uh, what uh, you should or shouldn't respond to? There has not been formal communication to this committee, no. Yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. We're going to go through a quick second round of questions here, so let me um, begin here. Uh, Commissioner Hamburg, obviously one of our key concerns here is that the FDA's process failed. For a year, inspections were suspended. I'm not sure we still have a clear answer yet of when you became aware of that. Um, and we also recognize this has gone on for 10 years. There's nothing political about this. This took place under different commissioners, different administrations. What I believe a number of us are concerned about is that while you were here asking for some new laws and new authority, I for one am not yet convinced that the FDA has taken steps to clean up its own house here. Inspectors wanted to go back and reinspect. They were frustrated because of decisions by the chief counsel's office to delay it. Now, it would seem to me that a common sense next step would be for you to call together a post-mortem after you became aware of all these problems. You had the people together responsible and said, who knew what and when and who made this decision and why? So I want to ask, have you gone back and had such meetings with your agencies? Uh, and have you done this post-mortem and uh, ask your staff to review the process that took place? We have looked very carefully back at at some of the steps that were taken, decisions made, and as I said, I'm troubled, you know, that we did delay because of internal discussions and conflict and the changing um, uh, legal landscape and not being certain exactly what law we would be applying in different parts of the country, et cetera. So we have taken that deeper dive. We also have reorganized within FDA um, to try to strengthen our efforts in this area and, as you noted, have embarked on a much more aggressive effort to use our current and existing I understand that. And you told us you've, you embarked on a more aggressive effort. We've seen you doing more inspections now. You've acknowledged that. And you've made some recommendations to us about changes you wanted in the law. What I'm asking is have you had an internal formal investigation? where you have addressed the issues that have taken place. For example, has anyone at the FDA at your request talked to the head of the Center for Drugs about the NECC or, or Meridose cases in terms of what happened? We have internally had, you know, many ongoing discussions about, you know, not just the specifics of this case, but also the broader efforts with the compounding industry. And I think we all agree that the, the FDA could have done a stronger job and that we are committed to doing so going forward. But to do the best job for the American people, we do feel 
that our regulations, the ambiguity of the statute, the conflict. I understand that, but I'm trying to find out about the postmortem done. All compromise. I'm trying to find out what the policy change within that. We'll address the ambiguities and other things of the law here. But did you talk to the head of the New England District Office since the uh, since you became aware of the problems with the NECC? I with, have you talked. Uh, well, the the head of the district office that you're probably referring to retired um, around that time, but but we have had discussions, and you know, I clearly we want to learn as much as we can about the the um, inadequacies of of past responses to the compounding Well, then let me ask this, because I... So we can do a better job going forward. Commissioner, we're trying to help you. We really are. If you've done a postmortem, if you've done this analysis, that for 10 years um, handcuffed the agencies from moving forward because of internal decisions, there was multiple times that the FDA knew about problems taking place in states but it appears that they didn't call Massachusetts or the states to say, we got this complaint, you are the agency in charge. And I go back to uh, when you say that um, you want them to report adverse events so you can mitigate as fast as possible. One of the ways to mitigate is to inform the states. You don't have to take other action other than to pass it on. I'm not sure yet I hear that there have been a change, there's been a change in policy. Has there been a change in policy with regard to notifying states uh, of information you received. We are, we are actively engaged in that now. One thing we did was, in fact, to bring in all the 50 states soon after this event to start to talk about how to strengthen communication. So there's no specific right policy at this point to say when we get a complaint that's to be passed on to the state of jurisdiction until such time as we can clarify that you have authority, you know the states of authority. Do you have a policy in place that those complaints are to be passed on to the states right There away? has been a reorganization. We are have identified a, a new set of, of players to work on this, and we will be who is, um, who is committing that? to stronger follow-up with the states, and uh, we will Is that an automatic process now? Is Pardon it going to go through? See, because part of the problem here is it goes through lots of what we've heard from you, is it goes through lots of chains of lawyers and discussions. And there's one year that no inspection is taking place. Everything was on hold. Uh, there was a long period of time before a complaint was responded to. And what you're telling me is there's going to be more discussions. That does not satisfy, I think, the, this committee no, or the we, American public to know that you're going to have more discussions. They want to know about action. Do you have some automatic policies that have kicked, that you've authorized now, and received complaints from the states who have jurisdiction, you said, that they automatically get that information? We have set up a structure to ensure that those kinds of communications occur. We also do try to respond and ex investigate is it automatic that we get and the adverse event reports we well, would you give us any documents that describe that policy now because I, I I'm not satisfied with saying you're going to try you're going to review you're going to discuss I think this is what hamstrung the FDA for the last 10 years and why in the words of one family who lost a loved one they said they don't trust the FDA if there's one federal agency among them all that we ought to have an inherent and implicit trust to be the FDA, and I don't think that's there right now. So I would like you to share with us those policy documents so we could know that. Thank you. In a timely manner. Uh, Ms. Gett for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the real issue here, Commissioner Hamburg, is what authority does the FDA have that they didn't exercise for whatever reason in the last 10 years? And what, uh, what new authority does Congress want to give them? I, I never met a member of Congress on either side of the aisle who said, you know, I think the agency should just go out and do whatever they want. Um, we're always concerned that the agency acts within the authority that we give it. But, but if you already have the authority, we want you to exercise that. If you need a clarification, we want you to do that. I think that's pretty clear, correct? Correct. Okay, so, so I, I want to talk to you specifically about the authority that you have because Mr. Burgess, in his questioning, he accurately said that the FDA has authority over drug manufacturers, correct? Correct. But under that authority, that's not the authority that the FDA has over compounding pharmacies. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and that's because... The, the courts and others have determined that compounding 
drugs is not the same as manufacturing drugs. Is that right? There are certain explicit exemptions for compounding pharmacies from the authorities we have over conventional drugs. Right, and that's in Section 503A of the 1997 Food and Drug Modernization Act, right? That's right. So in 1997, when Congress enacted that law, we specifically set forth, we thought we specifically set forth what authority the FDA had over compounding pharmacies, correct? Correct. And what's happened since 1997 Number one, the nature of the industry has changed. There's, it's not just the mom and pop pharmacy down on the corner, right? Right. And the other thing that's happened is that around the country, the, some of the compounding pharmacies have been aggressively challenging the FDA's authority, even under Section 503A, right? That's very true. And that's what we talked about before with the, with the confusing... Um, court cases, right? So now what happens is, you know, and, and, and I, I want to say, yeah, I share everybody else's um, uh, deep concern that the agency really fumbled around for about 10 years. Okay, so now you come in and you say, this is appalling. These people shouldn't be at risk. You know, this, this poster over here with the black stuff floating, that's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. You agree with that, I right? I absolutely agree. So now you're trying to take the authority we gave you under 503A and to inspect uh, at-risk pharmacies, people that you think might have a trouble, right? Correct. And what you're saying to us is that, that these pharmacies are pushing back and they're saying that Congress did not give you the authority to, to conduct these investigations. Is that right? Yes, and it's broader than that in terms of we don't have the authorities to have a regulatory regime that makes sense. Okay, what is it specifically that you need, Commissioner Hamburg? We need uh, these compounders of high-risk products to register with us. And, and how do you know what the high-risk products are? Well, in order, we also need the authority, the high-risk products we define as the, the, the highest risk, I think, are the sterile products. We all agree on that. Okay. Um, we need inspectional authority and full access to records in order to determine if a compounding pharmacy, in fact, is making products of concern and, and, and you know, how they're distributing, et cetera. Clearly, there should be a uniform set of standards for safety practices okay. for quality manufacturing. Do you know that you don't have those inspectional abilities now? Uh, we, pharmacies are exempt um, in uh, terms of full inspection requirements and access to records in uh, 704. Okay, so, so the answer is yes, you know you don't have that authority, right? And what other authority do you need? Uh, we, we need, I mean, I sound a little bit like a broken record, but um, we need the authority for high-risk manufacturers to register with And then once they register, what will that do? Then we'll know who they are and, and what they're making, how they're distributing. Um, if they're selling to wholesalers, then they're behaving like a manufacturer. And then do you think, once they register, then do you think if you get a complaint about them, you have the authority to investigate them, or is that the second thing you were just talking about? We need the inspectional authority. We need the ability to have these clear standards that they will adhere to for safety and that we can inspect against and enforce against. And uh, we, the adverse event reporting is very critical as well. And do you think that if we do some of this very targeted legislative language, that will help with what the chairman was talking to you about, uh, about the tensions between the, the regulators and the lawyers and the agency, which is really of a concern to all of us? I think it absolutely will. You know, I think we allowed ourselves to be far too cautious because of fears of litigation that might actually further undermine our ability to apply um, authorities and take enforcement actions. And that should not happen. Public health should not be impeded by those kinds of legal regulatory ambiguities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, recognize uh, again, uh, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. And in fact, uh, you have uh, authority over manufacturers. Isn't that true, yes or no? Yes. 
and with complaints from the state of Ohio indicating that there were a manufacturing process going on, I'm back to Ameridos, which is the sister of NECC, um, and the cease and desist from Colorado. Uh, Mr. Taylor, it wouldn't have been that difficult to probably get, if they refused to let you in, it wouldn't have been that hard to get a warrant under your manufacturing authority. Isn't that true for both uh, NECC and Ameridos? I, I'm not sure that. I mean, it takes more evidence than that. But let me just, let me just to your point, you know, communication with the states is one of the things that we recognize needs okay. to be improved. But, but the bottom line is you and I both know as, as practicing attorneys that it doesn't really take a very high standard to get a, a, a warrant to go in and get information, particularly when the risk to the public is as great as it is when you're doing things with sterile injections. Isn't it true that it's a fairly low bar to get a, a warrant under these types of circumstances? Yes, yes or no? No. Um, it, it requires it – All right. Requires, we, I respectfully disagree. I've got to move right. on. All right. I only get five minutes, so I, I'd okay. love to have that discussion with okay. you sometime, That's but not fair. today. Um, I am um, I'm concerned that, that you all were receiving, Dr. Hambrick, uh, you all were receiving a lot of things. If you look at tab 31 in the binder that's there on your table, and then you, you flip over to page 3, a summary would be that in July and August of 2008, FDA – came to uh, Maridose for inspection. The company performed. This is a, an informant statement that was sent to you all. It's in the documents you provided us. In July and August of 2008, FDA came to Maridose for an inspection. The company performed illegal and unethical actions. They directed the testing facilities to change report, reports based on the drug resorts. They forged documents. Now, that, that was the person referring to July and August of 2008. This was received by you all, according to the information you've sent us, in August of 2009. And after that complaint came in, um, FDA New England District Office, Mr. or uh, and I don't want to, he may be a doctor, I can't tell here, uh, Shamsi, uh, after reviewing the complaint, sent an email saying, we are waiting for assignment from the Center for Drugs to go out and we'll follow up on this. Ameridose has been on our radar for quite some time. Commissioner, nothing was done at that time to further investigate Ameridose. Isn't that correct? You know, there, there was follow-up to, to many of the concerns that were raised. Okay. I Can you provide that to us? Because in the information we already have, there doesn't appear to be any follow-up on that. Can you provide that to us? Because apparently it was neglected to you were somebody neglected to give that but to us before, I, before this I want to be clear. Yes, ma'am. That I do not feel that we responded adequately, but that I'm asking you to respond adequately to this committee and and the, the documents that we have in the binder here don't show that you responded at all after that complaint came in in 2009, even though your New England District Office was asking for clearance to respond. We are waiting for an assignment from the Center for Drugs to go out and we'll follow up on this. Amardose has been on our radar for quite some time. And you didn't follow through unless you've got documents we don't have that you failed to give to us. What, what I am saying is that we get a lot of, of complaints and, and uh, so more authority really wouldn't do you any good. The specific there. But there is just no doubt that, you know, I, I, I don't think that we responded with the, the vigor that we should have. I do think that we were. So now you're saying that you didn't follow up on that? No, I'm saying I can't speak to the specifics all right. of, of all of the 30,000 documents. All right. Um, you also received information, and that would be tab 32, um, an internal source that Ameridos raised in July and August of 2010. And the source was identified as a pharmacist in the notes that you've given to us. And according to a memorandum of conversation between the pharmacist and a compliance officer, the pharmacist said that Ameridos personnel from their sales force were assisting in labeling operations. This is the sales force. Assisting in labeling operations in the clean room and that one of the three clean rooms had a result for positive mold growth. Now, the sales force is not supposed to be involved in that, according to other documents. That's correct, isn't it? They're not supposed to be cleaning up and labeling things. Correct. They're supposed to be selling. And yet th there's a, a note here that there was a positive result for mold growth. That individual was told that the FDA takes this seriously. There's an email in that tab 32. 
that this is taken uh, seriously. Mold growth can affect sterility of drugs. Now remember, this is the sister to NECC. It's usually taken seriously by the FDA, but the FDA didn't follow up, so it wasn't taken seriously in this case, was it, ma'am? I, I, I cannot speak to the specifics of, of that instance, but those kinds of concerns are concerns that would worry me then and certainly worry me now. There are, unfortunately, too many ongoing um, problems with compounding pharmacies, and I really do feel strongly that, that if we are going to be able to... But Ameridos was also Thomas a manufacturer, was Thomas it time expired. I apologize, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. I yield back. Uh, now, the gentleman from Michigan, uh, Mr. Dingell, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Hamburg, we have here before us a most interesting circumstance. You've got a recalcitrant industry, trade association that's circularizing folks. Foundation of their businesses and in their protection of consumers. The, the, uh, they're instructed as to limitations on food and drugs authorities. They're also, uh, we also find that they're diligently at work to get the powers of food and drug curtailed and to see to it that uh, legislation, as was done here, specifically exempts them from three critical provisions, pre-market approval of new drugs, requirement that drugs be made in compliance with good manufacturing practices standards, and the requirement that the drug bear adequate directions for, for use, i.e. your labeling requirements. Uh, have, have those situations caused you difficulty at food and drug as you go about your business trying to regulate these good-hearted folk? We do not have the same kinds of problems with conventional manufacturers. I understand that, but, but you have huge problems with the compounders, do you not? We do. Unsafe clean rooms, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals that are compounded with all kinds of things, including uh, filth and, and other things in them, dust spots and, and things of that sort. Am I right? That's correct. Okay. So... You don't have authority to require them to register, so you know who's in the business, right? Correct. States have a somewhat varied record on these matters. Michigan has five people who are looking into this. Is that right? And, 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 and Michigan's folk cannot go across the borders of the state of Michigan to look, see what those good-hearted folks in Massachusetts are doing to kill off Michigan citizens by unsafe pharmaceuticals. Is that right? Yes. You know, I'm not familiar with the specifics of state laws, well, but, but it but, creates but, a real – we've heard from the states that they don't feel that they can provide adequate regulatory oversight okay. of what's happening in pharmacies and other states that – Now, you have them. no authority to get books and records and to inspect is, is compounders. Is that right? We are limited in our access to records. All right. And you have no authority to inspect the business according to what they – to what they circularize, circularize – their memberships from the trade association. Is that right? That's right. Now, you have, uh, you have no authority to require information on adverse events, right? Correct. So on that wonderful event that occurred up in Massachusetts where they shipped all this bad stuff around to Michigan and other places, they had no requirement and no responsibility to circularize, rather to inform you of the events that occurred. Is that right? That's right. And you had no authority to extract it from them. Is that right? No authority to inspect, to fully inspect? You had no authority to, to compel them to oh, present, yeah. present that information. Is that That's right? Correct. Okay. Um, and you have no requirements for good manufacturing. You have no ability to impose good manufacturing practices on them. Pharmacies that are ex exempt under existing legislation, right. we and don't have that. And good authority. manufacturing practices are absolutely critical to seeing to it that the pharmaceuticals are safe. Is that not so? Good manufacturing practices are essential. All right. And you, you, uh, do you have the resources, the monies that you can, uh, that you need to uh, properly police the behavior of these organizations? 
We do not have the resources that would be necessary to put in place a, the kind of strong regulatory oversight we need. At what point, at what point does it cease to be compounding and become manufacturing? The well, hearted folks up in Massachusetts were turning out stuff by the thousands and you couldn't find out who they were, you couldn't find out what they were doing, you couldn't impose good manufacturing practices on them. But at what point could you have, could they have, could they have been charged with being manufacturers? They're shipping all over the country. Yeah, well, it's, it's a, an issue where people think it's black and white. Either you're a compounding pharmacy right. or a manufacturer. But that has been at the root of many of these problems in terms of the conflicting uh, court decisions. And it is not written in the statute. Do you have... The actual, Statute is ambiguous. Do you have the personnel to inspect these people? Uh, we don't have the personnel to inspect okay. all. Now, now, doctor, do you have the authority to ban bad actors? Uh, these folks not directly. Uh, the compounding pharmacies oh, are licensed these by the people state. People in Massachusetts that are that are that are creating thousands of prescriptions that are being distributed all over the country. Clearly, to me, they're a bad actor. You have virtually no authority of them. What can you do about them? Well, I think that if we want a system that's really preventive and protects against problems and assures safety, we do need new legislation. Right, I now, think what that authority, what authority do expired. you have to supervise to see to it that stuff moving across the state lines that's supposed to be supervised by the states, which can't do it, uh, is, in fact, not something that's going to create safety problems for people. Now, you, you just submit the answer to that for the record. Okay. Because, Mr. Chairman, you have graciously given me a minute more than I'm entitled to. I thank the gentleman. Uh, now I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for five minutes. I thank the chair, and I yield to him as much of my time as he may consume. Uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Hamburg, uh, you – have said repeatedly in one version or another you feel you don't have the authority to have strong oversight. Um, my concern remains that where you do have authority, you haven't had that kind of oversight that you can exercise except for the recent flurry of well-publicized inspections. Let me run through some specifics here to again illustrate my concerns of the agency for 10 years and hopefully uh, your comments of what you've done to rectify that within the authority you have now. The FDA inspected NECC in 2004, primarily in response to complaints related to the company soliciting a product being used in cataract surgery. You may recall that if you reviewed that. The violations letter the FDA observed during that inspection were finally addressed over two years later in a warning letter issued in December of 2006. That warning letter noted the concerns about NECC and mentioned the fact that NECC was reportedly informing physicians' offices that patient-specific prescriptions were not required. Do you recall that from the history? Okay. Again, it wasn't under your, under your administration, but I just wanted to make sure you knew that. NECC responded immediately in January 2007, noting that it had been over two years since FDA had been at their facility and re rejecting a number of FDA's charges. Is that correct? Yes. Now, in tab 16, in your bind, if you look at it there, uh, Stephen Silberman, who was then the director of the Division of New Drugs and Labeling Compliance at FDA's Center for Drugs, thought that, quote, NECC's response was unacceptable, unquote. Do you agree that staff appeared frustrated with the fact that it took Chief Counsel's Office two years to issue the warning letter? Yes. And this frustration appears to have been shared by Deborah Otter, uh, the head of the compliance at FDA's Center for Drugs at the time. In an email to Mr. Silverman, which is located in tab 17, Ms. Otter stated that they have, quote, completely lost sight of the point that the warning letters are intended to quickly get word to violators that they need to come into compliance. Instead, the lawyers are concerned about perfecting documents that quickly become irrelevant. Now, do you agree with this observation that concerns about perfecting documents have resulted in delay when issuing warning letters? I am concerned when there are those kinds of delays. And you know, the key is, does that mindset still exist today? I think that the mindset is very different. I think we are determined to use the authorities that we have to the greatest degree that we possibly can, even in the face of challenges to our authority and in the face of 
potential inability to actually um, be successful in some of our enforcement actions. We're doing inspections now. We're finding um, things that are of serious concern. We intend uh, to pursue those concerns, and already there have been recalls um, and other actions taken, but we intend to use the authority we have to the greatest degree possible. But I am deeply concerned that we don't have the authorities we need to have the kind of system in place that will provide better protection and that will reduce the kinds of problems that we're seeing that could put people at risk in the future. Did the FDA have the authority to suspend inspections in 2011, 2012 for NECC? I think what happened there was what happened in other instances as well, where unfortunately because of um, a lack of clarity about what should the regulatory and enforcement framework uh, be, that we slowed down, we weren't as aggressive as we could have been, and I regret that. What, but what I other don't instances? think that we have a system now in terms of the authorities that are available to us that is sufficient for these highest risk manufacturers so, making the sterile products. So have you identified who made this decision that the inspections wouldn't take place against NECC in 2011, 2012 in your postmortem? Have you determined who that was? It was an ongoing was? debate that was reflecting the fact that um, decisions, a series of legal decisions had come down. Mm -hmm. There was um, a an issue about whether to go to the Supreme Court to try to resolve the circuit court split. And then we were sort of left with the map and trying to determine what was the best way to so, develop so given the that, enforcement. Have you gone back and to see if there's any stalls or other problems like that with other companies under who are compounding pharmacies? I know you just did a bunch of inspections. Have you gone back to see if those, those conditions exist for any other pharmacies? I, I'm sorry, in terms of well, it, we, it did any, any we, other suspe uh, During that period, we were not aggressively pursuing um, compounding pharmacies in a proactive way. We were responding when complaints uh, came to us. We were, in fact, engaged in some litigation around compounding pharmacies. Um, and sadly, one that we thought was one that would um, be very successful, and we lost. Um, all of that was contributing to the sense that the uncertainty and ambiguity in the law and the, the patchwork of application of this law uh, was making it harder for us to do uh, our job. I, I appreciate that, and I, I, I know that the concern still for the American public is these discussions were taking place, lawyers, et cetera, but still um, it wasn't addressing your, your primary mission that is taking care of some of the, the public's health first, but we'll, we'll, we'll con continue to talk about that. Mr. Waxman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I haven't been here throughout the whole hearing, but it, I find it hard to understand why anyone would argue with you that you had enough authority under the law when it's clear that two different circuit courts have said different things about a law and limited the amount of th actions you can take. For example, under existing law, under the underlying law itself, you can't, um, you, can, you can't have sample collections, you can't, uh, just go through some of the things you cannot do. Under 503A? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's, there's, of course, the broader issue. Well, let me, let me, look, I, I, I don't, this is not where I wanted to go with my questions, but there's so many things you cannot do, including some things my staff pointed out to me, and I wrote it down, and I can't read my writing. <laughs> but well, I'm happy I, to discuss. it's hard for any reasonable person to not conclude you need a stronger, clear law to give you uh, authority. But people want to go over the history. And so I want to ask you about the history of the Obama administration. I mean, this started much before. But in 2009, the Obama administration entered office. For seven years, the Bush administration had been stymied by a series of conflicting court decisions and an inherently weak law. So leaders at FDA met in the spring of 2009, and according to the notes of the meeting, the participants acknowledged the risks of compounding and set forth a new path for a national policy. Ultimately, they decided to implement Section 503A nationwide, except in the Ninth Circuit. 
And there they would implement a compliance policy guided based on Section 503A. Most of these decisions were made before you were confirmed. Isn't that correct? That is correct. But can you elaborate on why, in your understanding, the agency made those decisions? Well, I think that we were faced with a situation where we felt we did need to do more, and there was a lot of eagerness, as reflected in the documents, to mm -hmm. do more, and we needed to determine the legal framework that we would be applying. We needed to... Uh, you were looking for the most legally defensible way to develop a coherent national policy. Well, that's absolutely right, and I... And so as you looked at different alternatives, you said, well, we can't do this, you can't do that. Is that right? That's absolutely right. Can you help us understand what FDA's concerns were about going forward with inspections and potential enforcement actions before re releasing a new uh, compliance policy guidance that would give a coherent national policy to address conflicting court cases. You were asked earlier why the agency couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time, that is, conduct the inspections while developing the CPG. I assume the agency had compelling concerns about the problems it would encounter if it had conducted the, those inspect, inspections. Can you describe them for us? Well, I, I, I would like to address this question oh, to Mr. Okay. Taylor, because he's the enforcement expert. I'm sorry, I was listening. I, okay. Put your mic on, first of all. Okay. And what I want to know is, uh, why couldn't the agency go forward with the inspections at the same time you're doing a CPG? Well, the, the, the and I wasn't there, but, but people were worried that if they moved ahead with actions, with the circuit's court split, and without clear guidance, that it would lead to losses in court, some losses that would possibly undercut the authority that the agency had further. So there was a fear that it could actually make this unsettled legal landscape even worse, and it appears from the documents that that accounts for some of the conservatives, uh, which we regret, which is why we're being more right. aggressive now. Right, well, why, you, why you're here and why you have to uh, answer questions. Um, you know, I know one thing. If you had acted, you know what would have happened? The uh, compounding industry would have clear, ordered their, they would have uh, alerted all their members. They would have aggressively pursued uh, back in the public and on the Hill uh, uh, to push back on you. Maybe you would have gone to court. Maybe they would have sued you to go back to go to court to challenge what you were doing. Uh, FDA probably would have faced pressure from members of this body to pull back. In hindsight, it's, even easy, it's easy to blame the FDA, but in the real world, ruled prior to the outbreak, it would have been very hard uh, to do this. Um, one internal document said the agency intended to release the guidance by December 2011. The subsequent internal document indicated the agency was trying to get the document cleared by September 2012. October came and went. Dozens of people died in the meningitis outbreak, and still FDA issued no guidance. So my questions, what happened here? Why did it take the agency this long to get the guidance out? Had you gotten the guidance out? Do you think you could have prevented the meningitis outbreak? Can you describe what what the guidance would have accomplished, and can you describe what the guidance would not have been able to do, and would the guidance have eliminated the need for new legislative authority that you now seek? It took too long to get the guidance out, but it is important to understand what the guidance actually represents. It is just that. It's guidance to industry about how we would be approaching regulation in this area. But the guidance is only as strong as the underlying statute. It cannot substitute for a strong, clear law. You cannot fill gaps in the law with guidance. And so it was an imperfect second to what we really need and what we are hoping to work with all of you to do, which is to get the kind of strong, clear law that is necessary to put in place a program that is, is comprehensive in terms of the kinds of authorities we don't have now, that focuses on the highest risk um, producers of the sterile products, and that will enable us to really work with industry in a preventive way rather than being you know, forced into a situation where we are more reactive than we should be. Um... Yes, I thank you. Thank you. Let's work on that law, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Johnson, that's five minutes. 
stepped in. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Hamburg, uh, despite your assertions at the last hearing that FDA really doesn't know how many compounding operations were out there because they didn't have uh, access or didn't have register uh, with the agency, FDA has recently embarked on a sweeping risk-based inspection campaign targeting approximately 50 facilities, primarily of large-scale compounding operations. Is, is that right? That is correct, but okay. it's not Good. because they have Commissioner Hamburg, then in your opinion, how many of these companies uh, have been operating in the shadows? We targeted these uh, inspections. The thir about 31 of those inspections were surveillance. Others, the rest of them were for cause when problems were brought to our attention. But we targeted them based on, on information that had come to us about concerns that they were making sterile products. Um, but that is not an adequate approach when it comes to really being able to have a rec regulatory system that enables us on a routine basis to go in and do inspections and, as I said, to work in a way with the companies so that problems can be prevented. So how did you determine which facilities to inspect? It was, it was a risk-based um, determination um, using information from different sources. From so it's safe to say then that many what, of these companies had long been on the agency's radar, correct? Some of them had been, some of it was based on what states had told us, some was public information from the media. Public information from the media. But, had, but had, you like received, had you received uh, 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 event reports? I think that's what we call it uh, earlier. Had you, had you received uh, reports from? I don't believe we had for all of the facilities that we inspected. I'd have to go back and ask. Well, what I'm trying to figure out is you, you didn't choose to inspect uh, um, uh, NECC and uh, you didn't choose to inspect Emeridos, but you, in, you chose to inspect all of these others and you don't even know whether or not there were event reports associated with them. So what I'd like, uh, if you would take this uh, for the record, to provide this committee with all the complaints that the FDA has received associated with their products and practices uh, because I think the committee could be enlightened by what your standard or what your water level is to determine who you're going to inspect and who you're not. I, I would like to see that, and I think many of my colleagues here on the committee would. That would be edifying to us because there's a, there's a real, uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of alarmed by what you just said that Many of them did not have event reports. Uh, it is not required for these. I, I didn't say it was. With I didn't say it was required. That's a judgment call, apparently, on who you inspect and who you don't. And you made the decision not to inspect uh, NECC or Emeridos, but you chose then, since the outbreak, to inspect these other 50. I want to see what the criteria is. What causes you enough alarm to want to go inspect? And if, in, if event reports that say public health is in danger and that lives are in danger, if that's not enough, um, I, I'd, I'd like to be able to, to understand that. Well, I, what I'm saying to you is that we need to have a system that actually requires these compounding pharmacies to register with us so that we will know uh, We're, we're not are. talking about the ones that didn't register. We're talking about the 50 that you chose to inspect. We chose what to was the criteria? in lieu of having information uh, that we think should be part of a strong and meaningful regulatory scheme going forward. But what was the criteria used, and how does that balance against the criteria of the multiple uh, event reports that you received uh, on uh, Emeridos. Uh, so I, uh, can you take that for the record? We and, can certainly uh, take that for the record. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think this goes to the heart of some of our concerns about what we need to do to have the kind of safety net um, in terms of Well, the heart of my concern is the judgment. The heart of my concern is the judgment used by the FDA to decide who to inspect and who not to inspect. And based upon your testimony here now, I have even further questions about that because you just said that many of the new 50 that you're inspecting 
did not have event reports associated with them. So I'm, I'm really confused how with as much advanced notice and concern that you had about Emeridos that something didn't trigger with your organization and you said the buck stops with you, how that did not trigger something at the FDA that that company needed to be, um, needed to be inspected. So uh, to, be, to be clear, uh, I need you to provide the committee, if you would please, all of the complaints that the FDA had that led you to, uh, with their products and practices, that led to the uh, selection of those 50 that you chose to inspect. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields it back now. Recognize the uh, gentleman from North Carolina, Ms. Elmers, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to follow one. I'd like to follow my colleague um, from Ohio. Um, of the 50 that were inspected, were they all registered with you, with the FDA? No, they were not. That's what I'm saying. Is okay, you but you just went in and inspected and chose to inspect. So I don't understand how then you keep reflecting back on the fa fact that you did not have the authority to inspect the numerous complaints that we have received here about Emeridos and NECC. How, how well, I then... I didn't say we didn't have the authority. And I said I regretted that we didn't, in some of the instances, go back in more quickly. But you didn't have the, um, and I, there again, I'm just jotting down notes here. Um, so you, you felt you were not, um, you didn't have the ability or authority to intervene? With, with, with Emeridos? I mean, you, okay, let, let's get back to, to, the, to the common sense of this. There are, there have been numerous, numerous complaints that over a 10 year period had been submitted. They were submitted to you, the FDA, things that were taking place in these facilities. Somehow, there should be that communication with the state. What, or of the complaints that were submitted, which ones were reported to the state? And, and I when? indicated that we would try to go back and look at that, but I said, okay, no, that. Were any submitted to the state? Were any complaints then passed on to the state? In certain instances, we actually went in with the state to do inspections. In certain instances, you did go, okay, I, would, I, I do want that for the record. I would like for you to submit the complaints that were passed on to the state and the number of inspections that, that took place with the state into these facilities, especially the Emeridos and the NECC. Now, having said that, is there a law in place now that prevents you from sharing information? No. Legislation, Not law, regulation, guideline that prevents you from sharing Share with the states? With the states? No, and I think that that is an area where we, we are trying to do a much stronger job. So there wasn't anything preventing you, but you want to do a better job. How do you do a better job if there wasn't anything preventing you? I'm just saying that as I look back over um, some of the That uh, this was an area issues, of failure. That I think that we could definitely benefit all of us by working more closely, having more systematized um, Because you have noted over and over again, the state has the authority, the licensure ability, the regulation for the state, and yet there seemed to be this, this barrier there for sharing information that had been given to you, privy to you. Now, let's, ba let's back up to some of the complaints here. Um, I just want to point out a couple, and this was, had to do with um, Ameridose. In one of the instances here, um, it talks about, it says FDA received another call from Emeridos, informant alleging that not only was the Emeridos sales team assisting in labeling in, in the clean room, but that one of the three clean rooms had a positive result of mold growth. Let me further that. That was August 2010, another August 2010. Informant called again a few days later stating that the mold was found in the hood in which operations took place. Dr. Hamburg, what is mold? Mold is an organism that can, can cause disease. And, and what, kind, what kind of disease? What, what is mold specifically? Uh, well, my microbiology days are long behind me, but it is, it's a microorganism. It is a fungus. It's, well, okay. It is a fungus. You, so you will acknowledge that it is a fungus. August 2011, 
An Ameridos informant notifies FDA when packaging was dropped on the floor, employees are told to pick it up and ship. He further stated that the bubble wrap is stored directly on the floor and that this room is dirty and never cleaned. I can go on and on. There's also an incident after the event, after 53 Americans were, were died as a result of the failures of these facilities, that there were dead birds found in that facility. Dr. Hamburg, what, what kinds of diseases can, can as result as of uh, uh, human contact with, with bird feces or droppings? Clearly, there are serious medical conditions. Um, Fungal disease. And clearly, the, the kinds of environmental exposures that you're describing are not acceptable to sterile practice. Absolutely not, completely and totally. And that is where I get back to the common sense factor here. When these things have been reported to you, how could it possibly be that they were not relayed onto the states? And with that, I, I use up the remainder of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Now, uh, recognize uh, Dr. Burgess of Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and Dr. Hamburg, thank you for being with us through this long session. When Ms. Elmers was just talking about the picking up of the product that had fallen on the floor and then was retrieved and, and still shipped out, it made me remember in this very subcommittee, probably four years ago, uh, Mr. Parnell of the Peanut Corporation of America undertook the same sort of practice in his peanut factory, and the consequence was a significant salmonella outbreak that sickened and I think uh, killed some patients. And Mr. Parnell is now in jail. So, I mean, this is, oh, he's, been he's been indicted. All right, I stand corrected. He should go to jail. But, I mean, those are peanuts to make peanut butter. This is a sterile injectable to go into the subdural space or the epidural space of a patient, and so it is equally, if not much more, serious what, what Ms. Elmers was just bringing up. I do want to say for the record, early on in this process, in, in September of 2012, I, I want to acknowledge the help that the CDC provided our office uh, when it was just almost impossible to get any phone calls returned or any information. Um, the doctors at the CDC actually walked me through what they thought was going on, and I have to say they did an excellent job of rounding up patients and, and getting people in for testing. I had never, it had been a long time since I'd been in microbiology too. I don't think I even encountered X0 hilum while I was in microbiology, but the, they did a very good tutorial for me on just what that organism was, how dangerous it was, even though it wasn't, was one that wasn't normally thought of as a, as a pathogen. Let's, you know, and I know we've been through a lot of this stuff over and over and over again, and, you know, this stuff with Ameridose, just, just, we just keep coming back to it. And I recognize a lot of it happened before you became administrator. And so, so I'll stipulate that. But in July of uh, 2011, you, you were the administrator. And in an exchange of emails that is uh, for you and your binder there, tab 37, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, once again, there's problems that have come up at Ameridos. I think it is Paige Taylor, a lawyer who, who sort of redocumented all of, all of the, uh, the, the problems that were there. And she sent that in an email to uh, the FDA's chief litigator. And the FDA's chief litigator, when she asked, should we not Reinspect. I mean, I, th he, I think he said, uh, well, it's Cedar's call, but if the problems are serious safety issues, why would we only issue a warning letter? Why not seize? So that is a valid question. I mean, at this point in July of 2011, the, the evidence is mounting that there is a problem. Meridos has come across the screen so many times. Um, your own chief litigator said, why are we doing another warning letter? Why don't we just go in there and shut them down? So why not? Well, I think that there was, again, internal discussion about uh, how we should proceed, and I wish that we had been more aggressive, but I am saying we are going to be more aggressive now. And you mentioned the Peanut Corporation of America example. That's an example where actually in working with Congress, we were able to get 
the additional legislation, the Food Safety Modernization Act, that gave us new tools to work with companies to prevent problems and to really address some of those kinds of concerns. And I think let's, that's let's, not let's irrelevant. Let's not wax too eloquent because we still have salmonella outbreaks and we all recognize that, but we all recognize that there were problems and they needed to be addressed. Well, your chief litigator went on to say, my concern is that if we just issue a warning letter under one legal theory and then either do nothing until we issue the guidance, which apparently will take forever, or as noted below, would put another nail in our consistent policy coffin. I mean, those words were, were kind of prophetic, weren't they? I will accept the fact that you acknowledge that the agency was far too cautious and that you're accepting some responsibility for, for that being that risk averse. But I just got to tell you, I disagree with Mr. Waxman on the, the issue of the, the circuit court split. I mean, yeah, there is a reason to protect a traditional compounding pharmacist. I used them when, when I was in medical practice. They, they fill a niche that needs to be filled. But the FDA has known for years that New England Compounding Corporation and Ameridos were not the mom and pop compounding. They were not traditional compounders in any conceivable definition. And I guess the concern as we wrap up this hearing it does seem that at the agency, the priority was on perfecting the policy or perfecting the policy guidelines and not on protecting the patient. And if we learn nothing else from this today, it is that the, the mission of the Food and Drug Administration should be first and foremost on patient safety. The policy will always work itself out if we keep that number one objective in mind. And Mr. Chairman, you've been very generous with the time. Uh, I don't know if the commissioner wishes to respond, but I will be happy to yield back my time. I think the gentleman in is, we have, uh, Commissioner, do you want to answer that question? I just wanted to underscore what Dr. Burgess said, that I agree that patients and public health have to be our first priority. And I want to assure you that we are going to be as aggressive as we can be with our current authorities, and that if you give us additional authorities that we feel we need to do the best job possible for the American people, we will use them. Well, uh, you know, I just have to say, it's gonna take, that takes a lot of time, and you know that. You know the, what the political environment is here in Congress. Why not just use the authority that you have? Don't ask us for another tool when you have existing tools. My old daddy used to say, it's a poor workman who blames his tools. Don't blame your tools, do your work. I think we need new tools. Well, to that, I want to thank you for coming today and uh, sitting through two rounds of questions and for the members' devotions to this hearing today. Now, the committee rules provide that members have 10 days to submit additional questions to the record witnesses. Let me say something very important about that. Uh, it was brought to our attention earlier today, Mr. Dingle and other members had asked questions last November. This is an opportunity to prove that the culture of delay within the FDA has changed because even with this committee, it is not. So I ask you to get the answers to the committee questions from last November to us by the 19th of April. And the members, since they have 10 days to submit questions to you, that you get back to us within 30 days of that date. It's, it's important um, because otherwise it leaves us thinking that the delays continue. I also ask unanimous consent to put the following documents into the record. Uh, the document binder at the witness table, subject to appropriate redactions by staff, opening statements of members, and the reports issued by majority and minority staff for this hearing, including uh, the report from Mr. Markey, the minority staff report of April 15th, and the majority staff report of April 16th. Uh, again, I thank all members for coming here, and uh, with that, this hearing is adjourned.